How's it going? My name is Steven Christian. I'm a medical student. I'm a STEM educator and I'm a visual artist. And so what I decided to do is I decided to actually record myself building some worlds. And from that, I developed a course called Intro to World Building. And so in this course, it's all about teaching you how to approach building worlds in a way that is relevant to your creative interests and will help you improve your creative efficiency. And so with this world building, we'll dive deep into the approaches, the processes, and all the things that make worlds unique, immersive, and it just allows for you to tap into uh, the things that you love about popular media and provide some of your own flair into the scene. Feel free to check out more information about it at stuckonanisland.com slash courses and it'll be available on Skillshare as well. Before we get started with the tutorial, I just want to let you know about some things. As you know, I make a lot of this stuff available for free so that you can learn and level up your skill set, you know, at a very low cost. But there are ways for you to support me. First and foremost, I'm on Skillshare. And so go to Skillshare.com slash stuck on an island and follow me and check out some of my courses that I have there. I have all the courses you see on my YouTube channel and many more. You can also support me on Patreon at patreon.com slash Iltopia. Here, you could have subscriptions that are monthly or yearly, and you get access to my Discord group and a lot of sneak peeks of things that are coming out soon, from comics to new courses. You have a variety of tiers and stuff that you could support, so definitely check it out. You could go to shop.iltopia.com, and it'll take you to this wonderful page that allows you to check out all my books, coloring books, augmented reality experiences, plushies, toys, and many more. This allows you to support my work and any of the stuff that I produce and put out there. All the proceeds go to funding all these projects that I release out for free on the internet, as well as paying for medical school. Because as you know, I'm a medical student as well. Last but not least, Follow me on all the social nets. Okay, so part one, which is basics and foundations of world building. The plan for part one is looking at what is world building, what's the point of it and why it's important, elements of world building, that includes the type of worlds that you can build, what are the tools to build worlds, I'll introduce you to my creative process and the workflow that I use to build my worlds, also, we'll talk about developing a style, kit bashing environments, building characters for your environments in your world, making your world more dynamic, and then making your world more immersive. Again, this is part one, which is more of the basics and the foundations of stuff. And then part two, we'll start to explore and create our actual worlds. And so if you already have your foundations, feel free to skip this section. But if you don't, I highly recommend this part. But if you want to jump ahead to just start creating stuff, go ahead and jump to part two. So the tools you'll need are pretty easy for this section. You'll need a computer, probably some paper, and if you want to use a world building tool like Scratch or Unity, you could definitely do that. If you don't, feel free to just explore whatever tools that you want. You're unhindered by this. The main purpose of this workshop, right, is not to teach you how to use the programs or use particular tools. It's really to teach you how to make stuff. And that is quintessential to the creative process. And so for world building, world building is all about exploring your creativity and being able to articulate that in an immersive way. And the long-term goal for this is that this is supposed to just introduce you to things that you can and we will build on. We will build our foundation over the next few hours starting now, and we will see where you come from at the end of this. Because world building is great, and it allows for you to really test what you're capable of. And so I'm excited to see what you're all able to come up with.
And so let's check out a little demo of a world building project that I did and using the process that I'm about to show you. And so, what is world building? World building is a core element of storytelling. And world building is a term used to describe the process of creating imaginary worlds. Often these worlds are fictional. And because of that, they have inherent qualities that can be grounded in reality. That means that there's history, there's geography, there's ecology. And 
essentially most of the stuff that we see around us can be incorporated into the worlds that we are building and engaging with. And so, where do you see worlds? You know, you see them everywhere. That includes novels, video games, movies, comics, sitcoms, all types of things. Anything that is related to entertainment is focused around building worlds. Whether it's Pokemon, Lovecraft Country, Static Shock, Insecure, or Harry Potter. A variety of mediums have worlds built around them and the reason we like them is because there's characters in these worlds that we enjoy and do they have to be completely made up not at all you can create a world based off of your life and the world that you live in already more importantly the more you make up and the more they're grounded in reality, being able to marry the two allows for you to make the most impactful and the most immersive worlds possible. Where it makes sense when you see it, but then there's this fantastical element that allows for you to really explore fantasy and imagine possibilities. And so who can make a world? Who has the opportunity to make worlds? Those who make worlds are called authors. And honestly, that could be anyone. It's anyone that comes up with an idea and is able to articulate it and share it with others. If you can provide a context for those ideas, and you can visualize and have it be grounded in something, you're making a world. And it doesn't have to be a visual medium. It could be audio, or it could be words. We think of authors as writing novels, but authors are just creators. Creators that put ideas out into the world in a variety of mediums and takes us all on a journey. That could be either fictional or non-fictional. And so why is world building important? What is the purpose of building a world? Well, essentially for me, world building is a core foundation of telling a story. Stories require characters, plot points, themes, and they require worlds that are built. If you don't have a world for your story to take place in, then the story will often feel disjointed and incoherent. And so one of the big things about building worlds is it allows for you to communicate ideas to others in a way that makes the people you're communicating with feel a part of it, feel a part of the journey, feel a part of the process. And so as you are sharing things with them, they're learning about the things that you're creating through the experience of existing. Very much like we learn about things as we go throughout our daily lives. And so as you create something that's more immersive, then you're able to communicate ideas that impact people more deeply. And so why is world building important? It allows us to share experiences. Storytelling is very, very powerful. And every time someone comes up with a story that resonates with people, it is news that can start national conversations. Often storytelling is used to share experiences and teach lessons to others through immersive experiences. And I often want to say, think. Education and empowerment and entertainment, right? Because education is all about relating information that is relevant to our lives that we can apply. Empowerment is taking that information, that education, and actually feeling confident in how we can apply it. 
And then entertainment is often how we are introduced to that educational and empowering information. We get our entry point through entertainment. We learn through education and we apply through empowerment. And those are foundations of storytelling, where there's a message in the story, there's characters that we enjoy, we want to learn more about it and dive deeper into it, and then when we have something that we could pull from, when we're inspired from some of the characters, we include that in our day-to-day -day living. It's our mission, it's our motto. We often think of the, the Just Do It from Nike. Just do it is often because of Michael Jordan and many of the things that we were entertained by. And what he did is he empowered us to not only learn the tools of the trade, but then utilize those to improve our lives. And so this is all a power of storytelling and based on world building that has been used to introduce us to things and, and keep us going throughout our day. Often we probably won't even know what life is without storytelling. And so being able to create worlds that allow us to tell stories is even more impactful and powerful. And world building allows you to build a community. When we share our stories and worlds we build, we create experiences that others can connect with. The things we share are extensions of ourselves. We share our passions, our fears, sadness, hardship, and joys. And we find common ground with other people so that we can connect and communicate with them. Community is foundational in how we connect with the world and the things around us. Our teachers are a part of our community. Our entertainers are a part of our community. Our leaders are a part of our community. And so being able to engage in multiple ways and find support to continue doing the work that you want to do, that's the power of world building. Where you, whether you need resources, whether you need engagement, whether you need guidance, world building allows for you to find and share the things that you need. More importantly, world building is great because it allows you to express yourself in a safe and creative way. This helps us convey meaning and purpose that helps us understand ourselves better and find commonalities with others. I instantly think about my favorite artists that create either stories or music where that creative process and the stuff that they create is a byproduct of what happened in their lives. And so the stuff that is attractive is the th stuff that is relatable. More importantly, if it's relatable, that means that we could pull lessons that we could include into our lives. That makes things even more impactful. So what are the elements of world building? We think about worlds and we think about them being everything, right? They could be paintings, they could be video games, they could be books, they could be immersive experiences, they could be novels. They could be music. World building is a lot of stuff. Literally covers a lot of stuff. But there's actually some actual elements that go into it. That transcend borders and actually are applied to a variety of different mediums. And so, types of worlds. We have static worlds, which you could think of as paintings and illustrations. We could think of... Dynamic worlds, which are more video and animation. And in some ways, you could say that audio is a dynamic world. 
Then we have interactive worlds, which are books and games. And the difference between static, dynamic, and interactive is sort of that spectrum of engagement, user engagement. So static, right? You can only look at the stuff. You can't really do much else and it doesn't change. What happens in a painting and an illustration stays the same. It does not change. Dynamic, when we think of as videos and animation and possibly audio, in any particular time, the changing of the world is based on the time sequence. And so, because video, animation, and audio, there's time associated with it, the dynamics is, over time, the world changes. Whereas over time, static worlds don't change. Over time, dynamic worlds change, and often automatically. Once you hit play, that world is dynamic. It's moving, it's changing, it's evolving. And so then we have interactive worlds. In interactive worlds, books, games, the world changes as you engage with it. And so if you hit play, the world will probably not change until you have an action. With books, you have to turn the page. With games, you have to move the characters. And so the difference between dynamic worlds and interactive worlds is with dynamic worlds, you hit play and it evolves over time. Interactive worlds, you hit play and the world evolves as you explore it, as you engage with it. And so what elements are also involved in the world? We think of all the things that make up the worlds that we already engage with. Whether it's geographic location, whether it's a system for work or for school, we're engaging in these different worlds that make up our identity. And so with that, we think of in a world or an environment, we have society, we have history, we have settings and landmarks, we have social customs, we have languages. And then there's objects and items and tools. I live in America, and America has a rooted history that goes back hundreds of years. There's different landmarks like the Statue of Liberty and settings. There's social customs. I'm black, and so I have black culture. We Most of us speak English as a language, and I'm using my computer to record this and I create using a Wacom Cintiq and a lot of various creative tools. And so my world is wrapped around me as a black creator in America. And so you can apply that to your world where those same things you can create and you can make a world that's believable. Even if it's not referencing your life, you could create a character that, ref that references. And speaking of characters, right? Characters are foundational for the worlds that we make. And we'll dive deeper into how to develop characters for your world. But characters, there's backstories for your characters, there's races for your characters, there's motivations and convictions, and there's even appearance. And so developing characters and designing characters are two different things. But combining the two allows for you to create worlds that are believable because often we experience the worlds through the characters. And so the characters ultimately embody the user's experience. And lastly, we have environments, maps. And so in order for your characters to actually explore a world, you actually need a world to explore. You need an environment. You need locations. You need geography. And so that's another element of building a world. It's having maps and environments. 
It's having geography. It's having climate. Mountains, rivers, lakes. Civilizations. Cities, towns. I'm recording this in Portland, Oregon. And Portland is a little... It's a pretty decent-sized town. Or city, you could say. There's buildings, there's skyscrapers, there's all that. And in Portland, there's also civilization. There's this saying called, keep Portland weird. It's a, it's a culture. It's a civilization that is really based off of being a port city that is finding its identity. There's Mount Hood, there's tons of rivers and lakes, and the climate, in many ways, is always rainy. And so in the Pacific Northwest, Portland is a very unique place to be at. It's different than Seattle, and it's different than other places on the West Coast. But Portland in and of itself, you know, allows you to experience certain things that you can't experience in other places. And so combining all these things, right, the types of worlds, the customs, and the society, the characters, and the geography, it allows for you to build these unimaginable places that really resonate with people. So how are worlds built? That's really a big question of, you know, you see this world, how is it actually built? And there are two ways to approach building a world. You can plan out everything before you begin, or you can just build as you go. Often, for me at least, you'll be doing a combination of both. You will have the opportunity to plan before, just to organize your ideas, and then once you have something solid and cohesive, then you will begin focusing on building the actual world. And so, it's not a matter of how they are built, it's more of how do you start building? Because right now, if you're able to tell a story and articulate yourself, you're building the worlds that you're communicating. Your life is all about just building worlds to navigate in. And so being aware of that and knowing how to navigate that efficiently and effectively is really the name of the game. And that's really the purpose of this whole thing. Giving you the tools to build worlds that you could use to communicate your ideas. That's it. So to start, you probably want to find key references. You know, answer the questions of what are you building? And really create something cohesive, whether it's a theme or just an idea, and grounded in reality. You want to build something that resonates with people. And the best way to do that is look up a whole bunch of stuff on Google, Pinterest, Instagram, online in general, and even books and other stuff. The whole thing is to pull from the world and incorporate into the world that you want to build. And then also, really just define those key characteristics that you want to add to your world. And for a lot of people, the start and the end are pretty, pretty concrete, right? You start at one place, and then at the end of it, you finish to another place. But the only problem is that the process, the process can be a journey. It could go up, it could go down, it could go around, it could go back. The process will take you so many ways to get to that end goal. And often we want to go just a straight line, but it can be, you know, a winding path. And so the whole purpose of this is to take this daunting journey, this daunting process of building a world, and breaking it down into steps that you can follow that allows for you to create stuff, iterate, create more, and improve on your skills. And as you improve, you explore the creative process that allows for you to innovate 
and learn more about yourself and have others learn more about you. And so the process really is come up with an idea, find references to help develop that idea, sketch it out, tweak the idea, and then fine tune the idea. And so this is more big picture stuff. Again, in part two, we're going to be learning how to apply these specific steps and flesh out worlds from start to finish. And so when you're building worlds, there's some great questions to ask and answer. First, why are you trying to create something? What is the point of it? Why is it important to you? And what will others like about it? And that's crucial because you want to know why you are doing this. Why people should care that you're doing it. And what are you trying to share with the world that will help people, entertain people, educate people, and empower people? You can create stuff and have only you create it and have only you engage with it. And that's cool. But if you're taking this course, you're probably asking yourself, how can I create something that connects and builds community? How can I create something that generates attention and possibly opportunities for myself? How can I create something that allows for me to express my ideas that I have a difficulty articulating with words? How can I tell stories that are impactful? And so that all focuses around other people and engaging with other people in an immersive and memorable way. And so being able to address these questions and articulate them in a way that gets to the root answer, it allows for you to take something that you are passionate about and you're interested in and be able to create something tangible that people can engage with. This is the why. Why do you do this? What is your purpose? What are you missing? And once you figure out that purpose and that mission, you can continue to make tons of worlds that build off of each other. So, what are the tools that you need to build worlds? There's software, there's programming languages, there's processes. And I'll give you a little bit of a glimpse of what my process is. And hopefully, this process allows for you to make worlds just like me, or even better. And so in terms of software, there's different forms of software that you can use to make your worlds. And there's a spectrum in this, right? Because you could use software for idea generation and organization, which for me, I use Google, and I use Pinterest and Instagram, and this software called ArtStation and DeviantArt, you know. Uh, mainly, these things are websites. Uh, you log on to them, and you're able to utilize these to get ideas and organize your thoughts. Then there's writing and scripting softwares, and those are the word processors for the most part. So Microsoft Word, Google Docs, Paper, Fade In, script writing software. Then there's sound tools. And those tools are able to help you capture sound in a way that either feels natural or allows you to be creative and iterate on it. And so I use Adobe Edition CC. There's Audacity, there's Ableton, GarageBand, FL Studio. These types of softwares allow for you to either focus on the pictures for idea generation and organization, the picture heavy stuff, the word heavy stuff with scripting and writing, and the sound heavy stuff with audition and audacity. So then there's 2D tools. And these allow you to create work in two dimensions. So there's drawing software, 
which is Photoshop, Sketchbook Pro, Illustrator, Clip Studio Paint. There's a lot of them. There's a lot of paid ones and a lot of free ones. And again, I will have a list of the different softwares that you could use that are both free and both paid. And so I'm creating a list to give you resources to navigate these so that you could try them all. There's animation tools and video tools as well. And so 2D drawing is for illustration, right? Something that's static. Animation and video tools are for moving, moving pictures. So two dimensions that move, they're more dynamic. And so those are Adobe Animate, Premiere Pro, iMovie, After Effects, Final Cut Pro. Think about this as the difference between static and dynamic. And so static would be drawing tools in 2D and animation and video tools are dynamic in 2D. Then there's 3D tools, which allows you to create three-dimensional works of art. And so that includes Cinema 4D, Maya, Blender, 3ds Max, Marvelous Designer, Daz Studio, ZBrush, and iClone. And what these allow you to do is essentially tell stories, animate, create stuff that's static, all that stuff, but within three dimensions. And so typically these softwares allow you to do static and dynamic things opposed to the 2D tools that only allow you to do either static or dynamic things. And lastly, we have our interactive tools, which are Unity, Unreal, Scratch, Lens Studio, Spark AR. Those are often the game development tools. And because games are interactive, the engines that are used to build games allow you to create interactive works of art. They're not solely for gaming because you could still make animation, you could still make pictures with these, but they're made specifically for gaming that can apl be applied to other things. And so if you're looking to build a 3D world with real-time rendering, you probably want to use Unity and Unreal because they allow you to do those things pretty, pretty effectively. And if you want to do some stuff in AR, VR, you could definitely use Unreal, Unity, Spark AR, Lens Studio. They allow for you to take things from other tools, such as 2D and 3D tools, like Cinema 4D and Photoshop, and you could add those to interactive tools to have interactive and immersive worlds. And so programming languages, what are those? There's a variety of programming languages that you can learn. C++, C Sharp, Python, JavaScript, SQL, HTML, and many more. And what these allow you to do is make things through procedures. And so if you don't know how to draw, if you don't know how to create things from scratch using your hands or using a variety of creative tools, you can actually use assets and code them to make these experiences and make these worlds. And so programming languages are algorithms. They are ways to make things based off of data and statistics. And so if you know how to utilize data and statistics and you know how to uh, capture things with, with numbers, you can utilize programming languages to approach building your worlds out. And often, once you have a base for building your worlds out with programming languages, it allows for you to create in a way that's very impactful. And so what is the point of all this? Notice how I'm just now mentioning the tools used to build worlds after introducing all of the other elements of world building. This is intentional. The whole point of learning world building and emerging technology, technology in and of itself, is to make stuff not learn how to use the software. You want to learn how to make things, create, generate. You don't want to learn how to use a tool for the sake of using a tool. 
we're teaching you how to use tools to bring your ideas to life. Not because we want you to master the tool. The reality is that you will never master a tool or a program. That's a pipe dream. It just won't happen. You, won't, you don't have enough time because they're always adding more things to it. They're constantly adding new features. And often those features are specific to a certain industry and you will just have no reason to use it. And so why waste time trying to master something that you will probably never use? It's not about how much stuff you know. It's about what you know and how you can utilize it. The beauty of focusing on different tools is that you are not tied to any particular one. And again, that can seem daunting. But ultimately, you'll realize that some software do things better than others. And there's going to be a lot of overlap in the softwares that you use where you can do it all in one software but if you utilize multiple pieces of software you can do things better in one software opposed to another and eventually you will use different softwares and tools to uh, realize different ideas and that's really just the process and procedures and the style that you start to develop with your work And so for me, uh, I'll sort of go through my workflow of how I try to build worlds. I gave you a glimpse of it with, um, with the other stuff, but this is sort of a, a way for me to like, this is how I use it. And so, you know, I always start by writing and generating ideas. And so I'll use, um, I'll use just paper or Microsoft Word or, or OneNote or Excel. Uh, to do that, right? So I'll often just start off with paper, just a sketchbook, and I'll just map out these ideas uh, onto different like lists and files. Then I'll go into Microsoft Word from my sketchbook, and I'll just convert all the sketchbook ideas to to text, and just try to make sense of the ideas that I have. I'll edit it a little bit, and then I'll sort of move that to OneNote, which is sort of the catch-all for all of my notes for all of the elements of the world. That one. In Microsoft World, like Microsoft Excel, I will try to map out plot points and I'll, I'll think of storylines and stuff in spreadsheets. And then Fade In is the script writing software that I use for like character dialogue, plot points, and, and you know, character development and stuff like that. So when, for me, I'm, I use about five different like things. I have five different steps for like generating ideas. And I sort of had that down to like something that feels uh, comfortable for me. And I do this because I typically work as a, a, a one man, you know, show in many ways. So when I write something on paper and then I try to convert it to Microsoft Word, it allows for me to proofread it. It allows for me to look back at it with a different set of eyes. And so I'll sit there and I'll have something on paper, then I'll sit there and type on it. And I'll be like, huh, that mess does not make any sense. Let me rephrase this. And, and it forces me to process the information in a different way uh, because I don't have a team behind me. And so I, I tend to sort of treat these as different drafts. I have a paper draft, then I have a Word draft, then I have a OneNote draft, and then I have an Excel draft, and then I have a fade-in draft. And so by the time I get to the fade-in draft, I'm already on like draft four or five. And, and by that time, if you know about writing, uh, the first draft might suck, but the fifth draft is always going to be better than the fourth draft because you're going through all that stuff. And so I have this, uh, I have the draft process incorporated into my process and I use different tools to sort of force me to uh, do that, uh, force me to do that. And so what it looks like essentially is going from Microsoft Word to fade in, you'll see that I have my you have my like my Microsoft Word here, then I have like my spreadsheet, and then my OneNote when I have all like my ideas sort of fleshed out in like a catch-all, and then it goes to the script right here. 
So from plot points to diagrams to all that to the actual script, which is the end result that like we saw in the script writing where I sort of gotten to that point. This is a, it's a process and it looks differently intentionally. And so then we have, you know, building references. And that's really the thing that I really enjoy where I sort of have ideas. I did a mind dump, I brain dumped onto the, onto a page. I don't have any more words to give to it. Then it's like, okay, there's these images that I stumbled upon on Google or Pinterest or Instagram. And, uh, and what I typically do is I say, I'm going to just make a mood board based off all this stuff. Cause I don't want to draw it all, but I was inspired by things that I stumbled across on just navigating the day. And so what I'll do is I'll just either copy and paste stuff from Google, or I'll go to Pinterest to make little, uh, Pinterest boards, or I am on Instagram all the time. And I follow a lot of great artists. And so I have you know, little lists of different ideas and stuff that like they just the IG algorithm just gives to me. And so it's like something my favorite artist posted. He's like, I really like that. That's something that inspired me. I'm gonna put that in my little mood board. And so when you're doing it, it's like building references. It's like Google is great for finding references. Instagram is great for sort of finding references from communities of creators. Uh, Pinterest is great for creating mood boards and uh, so is Google Docs and so is this program called Pure Refs, which I just started to use. And, uh, and from there, as you can see in the background, uh, creating a mood board is just really putting ideas together with, uh, with words and pictures that, uh, that encapsulate the, the feel of your, you know, the world that you want to build. And so from there, it's like my workflow then goes to just sketching. So I'll just have a sketchbook or something and I just play around with the idea on paper. And it can be as easy as just the sketchbook that I have or what you're gonna do is you just use like Photoshop or something. Uh, you don't need to have a graphics tablet. You don't need to know how to draw. You literally could just use stick figures or if you wanna use just shapes and uh, like Google drawings, you could use that as well. And so after you, after you find these references, then you're just starting to pull from those references and you know, have that be the reference points. And so, you know, for me, like the illustrative process is often fairly, fairly, there's, there's steps to the, to the process. And so I'll first start with just, you know, a loose sketch. And then that loose sketch will be a more fleshed out sketch. As you see here, just something very loose scribbles. Then you say, okay, let me add more detail. Then I'll add even more detail and ink it, and then I'll color it. And so it's like sketching, inking, coloring. Sketching, inking, coloring. That is, that is essentially what I do when I'm illustrating this, illustrating the ideas that I have. And so depending on how, how detailed you want it to be, that's how, that's how many drafts of something you need to do. And for that, right, like I'll do a lot of stuff in Photoshop in terms of like cover art and other illustrative work. And, but if I wanna do clean lines and I wanna make stickers or do any sort of, you know, polished, illustration, then I'll probably use Illustrator for that, uh, just because it, it just works a lot better with, uh, because it's a ve vector-based program. And so essentially like, you know, vectors, the difference between vectors and, and pixels when we're talking about uh, creating something is just that vectors have cleaner lines. You know, as you can see, vectors aren't as blurry as pixels. And because it's not blurry, then you could have a, a nice polished look to two things. But essentially like the workflow for me, when I'm like building a comic or building a, telling a story visually is that I'll have something in Photoshop, I'll do a sketch and then I'll, um, I'll continue to like add blacks to it or ink it. So I'll sketch and then I'll ink the sketch. If I wanna have cleaner lines, I'll do Illustrator 
but once I finish that, then I'll, you know, do some sort of combining program to add text and add all that other stuff. And I'll just put it out in, you know, Adobe Reader or InDesign. And sometimes I'll use like Clip Studio Paint, but really it's all about what tools do I think will work best for me to create the worlds that I wanna create. Clip Studio Paint works great for some things and it doesn't work great for other things. And so I feel comfortable just going from one program to the next because I care about just the world that I wanna create, not so much the tools that I wanna use. And so obviously, you know, Photoshop and stuff for like inking and, and, and coloring pages. And then uh, I use InDesign to sort of design the books and, and put that stuff out. And then when it comes to animation, I like to use a 2D animate, like uh, Adobe Animate. And Adobe Animate is just great for uh, just 2D frame by frame animation. And that's what I just, if I just want to draw a lot of stuff and then watch it move at the end. Adobe Animate is where it goes. Um, After Effects is another one I, I use. I don't use it as much for like 2D animation, but if I'm trying to do any sort of special effects or compositing, I can do that one. And then Premiere is where I sort of uh, render out my videos and, and uh, create PNG sequences for and, and stuff like that. And we'll sort of see examples of like my AR work where I am using Premiere to create the create the experiences. And then I'll add those as PNG sequences to my AR stuff. And then workflow for, for building the worlds, right? The workflow is that for 3D stuff, I usually, you know, I'll use Unity for like some animation and rendering and, and building out like the, the 3D world, then I may use Blender for like some 3D model manipulation and stuff, uh, Cinema 4D for like some character rigging and animation, ZBrush for like some 3D sculpting, iClone for some like prototyping of, of animations and Character Creator 3 for uh, like 3D character generation. And it, it's, like I use these programs because each one of these programs allows me to do like specific things. Like I would never use character creator for animation. I'll just create the models and the characters in character creator. And I'll put that into iClone for, uh, for the animation part. I can do animation in, in Unity and Blender, but I use Unity for like the AR stuff. And so I'll export the animation from iClone into Unity. And if I need to modify something, I'll probably put it in Blender first before I put it to Unity. And then with ZBrush, I just, it's just great for sculpting. And so if I just need to sculpt something real quick, I'll just add it, you know, I'll add, use ZBrush for that. And so in a nutshell, tools are tools. You could literally build a, a whole world with so many intricacies with Notepad and Microsoft Paint. But if you wanna make things, if you wanna just test your skills or just try to explore technology, you could do that with a lot of, like there's so many things you could do, uh, create worlds in. It's all a matter of what you wanna create. And once you figure out what you wanna create, then you could explore how you wanna create that. But if you don't know what you want to create, then it's really difficult to know how to create it or how to even start. And so the world building process, once you have a solid idea of what you want to create, then you can build worlds following just literally simple steps that um, we're just going to cover in this. Oh. First, you describe the world with words, because just words are just easier to uh, put down than pictures in many ways. Uh, then you have a roadmap of items that you want to include in your world. Then you create a board of references to your world. 
you you sketch a design, a sketch an idea of the world. You, you get out in Unity or any sort of 3D modeling uh, tool, and then you sort of populate it. You give it life, and and then you you make it you make it exist. You know, you give it sound, you give it animation, visual effects, all these different things, right? And so. Um, an example of uh, sort of describing in a world, uh, describing a world perspective, as I sort of worked on this project, uh, for me, I wanted to have a feeling of solitude with um, with teddy bear and the the composition. So that was sort of the world that I just sort of thought about. Is just you know solitude with a teddy bear in the center, and you know I wanted to have a similar feeling of how you know a dog feels when an owner leaves. Uh, for work or school, and you know the the teddy bear is sitting slightly lean on one side, uh, where my you know my main character Roscoe left him, and he is waiting for his friend to come back, and can be during the day or during the evening, uh, maybe some light coming in through the windows. Like I was actually just sort of like kind of channeling, like I'm channeling. Toy Story, you know, I'm channeling something that sort of resonated with me and like what was sort of my twist on that. Uh, so it's not a completely new idea, but I'm sort of taking elements of what I was inspired by. And I'm just saying, this is what I want to create. This is a world where it's sort of somber and solid, you know, uh, has solitude in it. It's quiet. It's, it's sort of, you know, it has this particular feeling of, of longing. And so that, that's just me sort of uh, trying to capture the emotion or the idea that I have. Uh, obviously, it, it's it's just sort of like, it, as I look back at it, it just sort of feels like vomit. You know, it's it's there, but it's not, right? Like, it's there, but it's not. And so, but I described it with words. I have, I have words that are associated with these ideas now. They, it exists because you can see it now. It's not just in my head. And so then it's like, I, I wanted to roadmap items for, for the world that I wanted. So I wanted to include, you know, a ra red race park bed. I wanted to include uh, worn down walls and stained floors. I wanted to include old candy wrappers, something like dirty clothes on the floor. I wanted to have shoes. I'm a big fan of uh, the Jordan 13. So I was like, I need to have the Jordan 13s in there. You know, if I don't have any other shoes, Jordan 13s need to be in that room. Uh, then obviously I want to have like a teddy bear with the, you know, it has like a, a bunny suit on it. It's, uh, you know, it's surrounded by junk. It's orange and yellow. Uh, like I wanted those specific things in there. But then I also wanted to, uh, you know, just have the environment. And so, again, I didn't know what it was going to look like, but I, I had an idea. And so these are the things that I just wanted to include in it. And so then I created a mood board. And obviously I have my Jordan 13s. I got my teddy bear. I got my messy room. I got my red race, race car bed. Literally, it's the same stuff that I had in my uh, roadmap items. I looked for references of those online. And I just put those in like a Google Doc and stuff. And then... I decided to start sketching stuff out. So I sketched out the kinds of the characters, the room, what all that stuff would matter, look like. I I sketched it all, I sketched it all out. And then I decided to um, you know, sort of time lapse it and, and show the design process.
Oops. All the way back. Okay. So, um, so now that we had a sketch, right? Then you start populating it. You know, I had like 3D models that I found or that I was able to create. Uh, so I have a 3D model of Nimbus, the teddy bear. I have a 3D model of Roscoe, my, uh, the main character. Uh, then I sort of kit bashed and populated a room that I created. And it's all about being able to visualize what the sketch is, right? It's like, we have a 2D render of it, but what does it look like in 3D? Because obviously this is, uh, this is um, you know, this is, this is what we're doing. So, uh, well, uh, Kenji asks, for world building, are there points where too much detail can act as a distraction to the story, depending on the type of story, like a revenge or two compared to one of adventure exploration? So when you have a world fleshed out, it only adds to the relatability and believability of the story. If anything, more fleshed out the world world is the the better you can utilize the world in your storytelling and so if you don't know what if you don't know what the street name across the street is then you can't use that as a storytelling device meanwhile if you do know where all these things are if you have names for them if you can relate to them in a certain particular way uh then you're able to utilize those in your story and it, and it enhances your story. And so uh, in short, the more details you have, the more points of detail uh, time allows, uh, it helps the story, the way you can tell, utilize the world in your story. And so once I, uh, once I have sort of everything built, right? I have the world built out and now I can bring it to life. To actually tell a story in the world because I have the world out there now it exists. And so because this because the world was built, right? There's there was an environment, there was life to it, there was a context that what was just an image, you're able to actually tell a story that uh, people can resonate with, you know, 
what happens to your favorite teddy bear when you leave and you go to school? Like, what is what is the experience that that can be created with that? And how can you express certain ideas that uh, that you feel in these types of situations? You know, world building is a is a is a means in which you can tell the story in, and you can branch off and say, okay, but what is the day to day life? Why is the character so tired? You know, I can relate to this character at the end of the day because after a long day, I just want to lay in bed and I don't want to do anything. You know, and so uh, and so it building creates allows for power for storytelling what is kit bashing uh kit bashing is really just this whole concept of mixing and matching assets to populate your world and so you know in light of star wars day may 4th and i guess revenge of the fifth <laughs> um kit bashing was sort of coined by uh by Star Wars, where they actually didn't originally create all the models that were used. They actually just took models apart from other uh, assets apart from other models and they put those together to make the Millennium Falcon and, and make all these different things that we sort of know and love, right? It's, uh, it's, it's remixing things, repurposing things. That's what kit bashing is. And so the goal is you want to mix and match assets to create something new without having to do the labor of making every single detail. And I think for many, for world building and, and creating stories as a storyteller, that's what we do already. We're inspired by something and then we want to make something new from our inspirations. You know, in many ways, everything that we do is sort of kit bashed in a way. And so kit bashing, as I said, is, is where you take something from someplace else and you make something different from it. And it's, it's very quick, it's very easy. And, you know, you can build things that are cool, right? You'll have a, you'll have a set like this and as you could kit bash something that builds this, right? They don't look it. They don't look similar at all at face value, but when you when you really look at it, right, you have you have this part right here, which ends up being the flower. You have this right here, which is that red part. You know, you have all these different parts that you can recognize once you really dive deep and look into it. And so kit bashing really utilizes elements from other things and allows you to create something that's unique and different. And it also allows you to save time and, and focus not on the details, but the ideas that you want to explore. And so if you are focusing on details, you're focusing on details that, that lend to the experience, not details of, oh, this needs to be this fur that's going this way, or this needs to be you know, a hexagon versus a heptagon. You know, you don't have to worry about those details because the assets are already made. It's a matter of how do you utilize those assets to save time and still give your story justice. And so the, it allows you to avoid a lot of the technical aspects of creating things. And when you avoid the technical aspects of it, you save time and you have more bandwidth to focus on the creative side of things. And then, you know, you could spend more time on the emotional value and the themes of the world and not drawing just rocks and mountains because that mess takes forever, right? If you have to, if you have to render things out, then you're, you're, you're making yourself incapable of doing the other stuff. And so, how do you kit bash? That's the question. How do you kit bash? And, and really the thing is, you know, you take something from one place and then you make something different from it, right? And you do that by taking assets from other projects and you add them to your projects, add them to your folders, your asset folders, and then you just place them in the scenes and then you just put them right next to the other stuff, 
they're they're part of it now. And so, um, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you a a little demo. And so, one second, let me let me find my demos. I think this is one of them. Yeah. Okay, so there you go. And so with it, you know, all of these things right here, this is all kit bash. Yes, I had like the 3D models of like the characters, but the if you could tell the difference, there's a difference in quality in how this bus this bus looks and this this car looks, because they're from two different asset packs. You know, the particle system that you see here is from a different asset pack. The buildings are from different asset packs. Even the ground is from different asset packs. I even had different asset packs for uh, the animation where I was stitching together different animated elements that from different sequences. So as you can see here, this is, you know, some melee warrior animation pack that I was using the animation for, for, for these characters. And so it's like, this isn't, no, like melee warrior scene, but it it works because all you're doing is focusing on the world and and what you want to create in the world. You don't have to worry about all the little details of okay, I need to animate this this character running in this particular way. I could just find an asset of of an animation that had that in it. 
And so, so this is a this is a scene that I have. And the way it works is if we're talking about kit bashing, right? The way it works is, and let me try to find, there you go. So the way it works is I essentially add something to it. So say I want to, I want to have a mountain in the background. I have a, I have a whole bunch of asset packs that I sort of added to my scene. And so if I say, okay, I want to have a mountain in the background, I could type in mountain. And I'll have all these different, you know, I have a, a de desert mountain. I have, you know, some backgrounds. I got mountains with, um, you know, grass on top of it. I have a sky mountain box. And I have some like generic mountains. I probably want to probably want to try this one right here. So all I have to do is I literally can just drag that in my scene like this and say, okay, I want to move it back, lower it a little bit. And then say I want to have it in the background though, right? You see it, I want to have it in the background. I can make it larger by just scaling it up and scaling it out. And so now, if I want to add a, I can duplicate it and say, I want to have a city, you know, a landscape with uh, with mountains in it. And so I could just modify it a little bit, spread it out a little bit more, just giving it a little bit more variation. Maybe I want to try another another mountain type. I could add that to it too. And even if I want to rotate it to the side so that it sort of covers it a little bit more. And so now I have a cityscape that or I have a block that is sort of has mountains in the background. You know, say I wanted a helicopter in it. I look up the helicopter, see if I have one. Boom. And so now I have a helicopter. And maybe the helicopter is shining a light. So I could have what, like a, I want to say a, a flare or a light. Yep, just shining a light. There you go. And then say we we want some people. So we'll just have Add some people there. And say the story is that there's somebody running. Or maybe let's do an animal. 
what kind of animals do we have access to? So say there's a brown bear in the center of the, there's a brown bear on top of a, on top of a broken down car. And a boy is watching the brown bear wreak havoc as the, as the authorities are trying to apprehend the bear, right? And so that's just a simple story that we sort of kit bashed and, and put together real quick. There's a boy there. He's looking at the, he's looking at the helicopter shine a light on this bear that's tearing up this, this purple car. And it's on a city block, you know, in front of some mountains. My, that's, a, that, that's, that's the setting for an Oscar winner right there. If I don't, uh, if I don't say, so, say so myself, you know? This is a, you know, this is, this is, this is kit bashing right here where you're just finding stuff and you're just adding that to your projects and then being able to utilize that in a way that, that makes things easier to navigate. And so, you know, with it, it was like, I just had to come up with the idea. Then I just found the asset that I needed and added it to it, right? And so if you're able to do that, then, um, you know, Unity is a great tool to use to do that with and to the point where you can literally tell the stories of your comics through this approach. You have some characters, you have some animation maybe, you have some settings and you could build out the settings in Unity and then you could take pictures of them and have those be the backgrounds for your, for your comic pages. And, and then you just sort of go from there, right? And so with it, I mean, this is, this is what we have. This is, a, this is essentially the, the concept that we have that we're sort of able to play around with. Yeah, but I do have a living room scene where I just put together a whole bunch of stuff for a living room. Just something very simple, right? This is a, you know, when you're designing stuff like this, it, it's, it's just meant to, to be a reference point for many things. And so it's like, I have a little, like half of a living room that I just sort of designed for, uh, for stuff. And I guess for this one, I could, uh, I could actually show the process of like building this world out for this one. So I guess this will be the, this will be the final, the final video, I suppose, that I could show today. Every 400 years, a cosmic event of epic proportions. this what I'm doing is I'm just using the 2D image as like a reference point for me to sort of build out the 3D render uh, obviously with AR you know I find a way to like combine the two but I started off with the sketch just so I knew what the scene was and then then I was able to actually uh, build out the scene pretty easily because I knew what I wanted to add to the scene in terms of like assets and kit bashing and so that's the original asset pack that I, I started off with. And then I start stripping stuff away from it. And then I start adding stuff to it later on 
to, uh, to really make it work for the scene that I wanted to create. And so I added that TV and that, that nightstand because it didn't have that originally. And so then I start building out the, the animation part. And this is where I just start doing the additional kit bashing where I'm adding picture frames, I'm adding, you know, a frame for, or I'm exporting stuff out, like all the all the video assets that are supposed to be played on the screen. Then I'm adding my character models there, and then I'm starting to kit bash a lot of the animation. And so I'll take an animation file off the internet, then I'll add that to my scene, and then I'll start playing around with it. And then from there, I sort of had this animated intro already. So I just added that to the beginning of it. And then all I did was recreate this in 3D so that it actually feels like you're watching the show with the main character. And so with this, it's, it's really like the story is the story is the story of this is watching a story with the main character like what is it like to just hang out with the the character of your story for a tv show you just get to watch his favorite tv show with him you know so you're watching him watching his favorite thing and so and you're watching it too you know that that's a that's an idea that's a, that's a world that's built using uh using a lot of these assets and kit bashing and so with that hopefully this gives you a lot of uh you know gives you a lot of inspiration or, or reference points to explore it's uh this is a lot of stuff that is just you know it's just currently being developed with technology and there's tools that have been out there for years um but it's really all about that idea and like everything else, once you have the idea, then you can do a lot of stuff with it. Uh, you know, it gives you clarity, it gives you direction. So let's talk about building style. What does that mean, right? Like, how do you build a style? Really, building a style is very influential in creating something that resonates with you. And it also allows you to stand out, right? When we're talking about building styles, what we're talking about is a way to uniquely express the ideas that you want to see in the world. And so you can really do that by putting the pen to the paper, seeing what you're capable of, creating something, and then putting it out and seeing how not only how different it is from others, but also how unique yours is. And so building a style is really all about exploring different styles of others, whether it be visually or it be literally. And art styles are often defining characteristics of, of artists that we love and that we really look up to. And so as you explore this, right, you could create stuff, whether it be 2D, it be 3D, it be with text, it would be with images, even with sound. And even within those, you could explore different styles and combine the two, or three, or five, 
to make something that's unique to you, but still pays homage to the ones that inspired you. And so building a style, right? Developing a style and building it, it all comes naturally to us. We take the things that we love and we want to share it with the world with our little twist on it. And so as you create stuff, you start to find that style naturally. And when you're creating, you will learn what you like to create and what you don't like to create. And I think that's part of finding your style is that some might think that it's a waste of time to create stuff and then not show people or not even build on it. But if you work and you spend time on something and it doesn't pan out and you don't like it or you don't want to improve on it, then that means that's something you could check off the list that you don't want to explore anymore. And so therefore the opportunities for stylistic inspirations becomes narrower. And as you become narrower, you start to develop a style that works for you. And so you, the world might be broad with opportunities, but as you create and you figure out what works for you, those broad opportunities allow you to become laser focused on the things that you have expertise in and that you have interest in and that you find valuable in your creative journey. And so that could be pixel, it could be cartoon, it could be super deformed, it could be realistic, it could be 3D, it could be 2D, it could even be paper art. But your style will be a byproduct of what you create and what you build on, what you like and what you don't like. And so for building a style, right, it could be a multitude of things. The beauty of exploring your style is that you can incorporate a multitude of different styles into your creative process to where your style could be a mix of 2D and 3D. Your style could be very impactful animation with very simple characters. Your style could be hyper realistic, but also super deformed. Your style could be a, a multitude of different things that really speak to your interest in you as a person, as a creator. And so thinking that you could be an artist without being a human is a pipe dream in many ways because the more you create and the more you connect with people the better your art is and the more impactful your impact will be with your worlds that you create and so think about it right you could explore a lot of different things you could explore things within 2d within 3d you could explore things within vr within ar you could explore things within a multitude of them, and each one of those could have their own style. Where I could paint something, I could illustrate something, I could build something as 3D models, and each one of them can be reminiscent of the styles that I have for one or the other, but then ultimately they could be vastly different. And really the defining factor is me being a creator and me being able to create stuff that is consistent with my ideas and not necessarily the details of what I'm creating. And so an activity that you could use for building your style is build a style sheet of all your favorite styles that you love and want to be about and collect them in a document to reference for the worlds that you want to create. It's like building a mood board, but with styles and not necessarily with specific details. Because we'll get to that later. Whether you're a good artist or a bad one, having a consistent style is valuable in setting your work apart from the rest of the world. Because if you have consistency in what you're creating, then that ultimately defines you. And as you evolve with that consistency, you get better. You get more efficient. And so much like us in our, our lives, right? We start off trying to navigate the world and figure out what we want to do. If it's in school, you try to figure out what your major is and choosing your classes. But at the end of it, when you get to become a senior, you have a mastery and you have a comfortability. You have a level of comfort that has come with you being consistent down that path. And if you want to change it, you can. You have the liberty to do that. But starting on that path and taking that step forward and then taking that next step and that next step towards your style will make your world 
more unique, and even better. And so think about this as an extension of you. Just like we all look and sound different, so should the styles we have. And don't feel like you should be hindered or pigeonholed by those styles. If you want to change it, you want to switch it up, you want to explore other styles, you can. And hopefully you could come back to the other styles and incorporate those insights into it. And so styles, styles are great. Styles are amazing. And I implore you to explore the styles that you have. Okay, so let's talk about how to build characters because characters are very valuable in world building. And so when we're talking about building characters, we're essentially saying that uh, characters are foundational to building worlds because they often are the life of the world. In many ways, we experience the world that we are building and we're sort of interacting with through the characters. And so characters are very valuable, and that's why we need to give characters and development of characters uh, a lot of attention. And it could be it could be superficial. You know, you could use it as a first person experience where you're embodying things through the characters, or you could use characters as a conduit for ideas. And so when we're talking about it, right? The characters that we are building are the navigators of the world. And when we're talking about immersion, we're essentially giving the users, the people that are uh, experiencing these stories, these games, these books, these novels, we're giving them the keys to our characters. And so as the character navigates the world, we're able to experience the world through the character. And so the intricacies of the character impacts the experience that everyone else has with the world in and of itself. And so when we're talking about building characters, we're talking about not only the design of the character, but the development of the character. As you see with my main character, Roscoe, who uh, journeys us through the island of Utopia and does a lot of stuff in the world uh, of my webcomic, Island Fever, you see that a lot of the demographics for, the, for Roscoe are fleshed out. And they don't have to be nitty gritty details, but the more you know about your character, pretty much the more you know about the, your character, just like the more you know about your friends, the more you know about your family, the more you know about you, the better experience you have in the world in interacting with them. And so with Roscoe, he has a name, Obviously, it's Roscoe. He has an age, nine years old. His height, it's three foot ten. His weight, sixty four pounds. And he has his likes, his dislikes, his fears, his worldview, and his challenges. And so, with this, I really narrowed it down to elements that make up a character. And being able to fill out those elements allows for you to have a memorable character. And so, some of those things are just what the type of character is. Is they a hero? Are they a villain? Are they sinister? Are they honorific? What about their name? What about their age? What about their likes and their dislikes? Do they have any skin colors? What colors do they have? What clothes do they wear? Do they have any hobbies? Are there any fears? Do they have a history or origin? And ultimately, do they have any goals and aspirations? When you're trying to tell stories, characters having these things really drive the story because it allows for you to write, it allows for you to create with these characters in mind, and it, the way the characters navigate the world based on their demographics, that impacts the user's experience of the world. And so if we experience the world through characters, then having characters that, in, that people can embody is very, very crucial. And so an activity that we could do is really come up with your own characters based on either you, your friends, or your family. Give them a name, an age, likes, dislikes, colors, clothes, hobbies, fears, 
history and origins, and goals and aspirations. It's as easy as just jotting down that information and building designs and building characteristics for your characters. Lastly, we could talk about adding dynamics to the world. And dynamics are really crucial because they make things more engaging. And so making a scene more dynamic can mean really a multitude of things though, right? Often these things are most valuable when we experience them because they bring the world to life even more. We have a greater connection to them. They impact how we navigate the world because as we navigate the world, the world changes. Being dynamic means that it's not static. It's not staying still over time. It's not staying still as we navigate it. When you take a step on the road, you may leave a footprint. And therefore, that impacts the experience because it changes. It evolves with us. And ultimately, our interactions become a part of the experience of navigating the world. And so those can mean dialogue. It can mean animation. It can mean character movement. It can be sound. Dynamic is really just change over time throughout the experience. And it's up to you to really figure out what that can be and what that is. And so in order to add dynamics and immersion to the world, we can plan things out. You know, you can write a script and then from there you figure out what you want to add and what you want to do in the world. You can add a scene. You could add objects, you could add characters, you could add speech, you could add sound, you could add action. There's a, there's a flow to it where you're creating the opportunities for more engagement by adding more dynamics to your world. And it could be as easy as just a quirky sound that happens when somebody falls. Or a jingle that plays on a TV when there's a commercial that goes. Or one of the characters likes to dance, and so they break out into some sick dance moves. It's really all about what you want to do and how you want to add that to the world. And so when we're talking about adding dynamics to the world, we're really focusing on making the world more immersive. And immersion is the key to being more dynamic because immersive worlds are dynamic worlds. They're worlds that are more engaging because they incorporate multiple senses. And so sight, sound, touch, taste, smell. The more senses you could involve into the world, the more dynamic you can make it and therefore the more immersive it is. And when it's immersive, it's more memorable. It sticks with us. It resonates with us. And so making a world more dynamic can be interchangeable with making the world more immersive. And people love it. And so a thing to think about, right, is think about what immersion would be for your world and when you think about what immersion could be and would be, then figure out what it, you can do to add that to the world to make it more dynamic. And so to make something more immersive is to make something more dynamic. And to do that, you add sound, you add images, you add animation, you add user input, you add interactions. With a comic, you can add a page turn to engage touch for users. You can add thought-provoking imagery to add sight. Through AR, you can add sound and animation to add motion and to add music. You can even add user input. And so immersion is the way to make things dynamic and thinking about it and planning it out and implementing those elements in and of themselves make your world more dynamic. 
And so now it's time to create our immersive world. And this means we're in part two. So part two, we'll be talking about exploration and creation. Now that we have our foundation and we have the basics of creating worlds, we know what world building is, we know what the elements are, we know how to approach it, we know some steps. Now it's really time to dive deep into the steps so that we could create something that is really, really impactful. And so a recap from part one, which is our foundations and basics, is that this course is, again, not teaching you how to use a particular program or tool. We will be using tools in this, but it's not focused on teaching you how to use the tools. It's teaching you how to make stuff. And world building is making and creating. It's not using tools specifically. And so you can build a world in one tool and you can port it over to another tool and we'll do some exercises that allow you to do that. Knowing tools is really good because you can make worlds more efficient, but that's not what this is about. What this is about is world building and the core element of it, which is storytelling. And so anyone can build a world and those who build worlds are called authors. And there are a variety of tools you can use to build worlds. And I encourage you all to explore as many tools as possible because some tools work better than others. The beauty is being able to create something in one and then move it over to another to make it better and then move it over to another to make it even better. Ultimately, the goal of world building is to create something that speaks to you personally, but also resonates with others. Because if you can connect with people across the board, across cultures, across anything else, then that means that you're able to build worlds that transcend many of the limitations that we have with communication. What is world building? You know, uh, world building is the process of constructing an imaginary world. And so we think about uh, really ideas or an imagination. And, and we think about that in the context of, you know, what does it look like? What does it feel like? What is it? Well, uh, what happens in it? Uh, how does it work? Is there, is it dark? Is it light? Is there a sun? Are there stars? Are there sheep? And so, uh, you know, that, that's, that's all come from our imagination. And we really see these worlds exist in books, games, movies, shows, comics, really like any sort of entertainment. And so if you, if you see something, you're experiencing a story, if you're experiencing something uh, that's entertaining, most likely it's because you're experiencing it in the world that was created to support it. And so in order for you to experience something, you have to have a world that it's grounded in. And that's what this is all about, creating a world that, uh, that allows you to, to tell stories and, and create experiences in. And so uh, what are the elements of, of worlds, right? Um, in order for you to have a world, you need to have geography, you need to have environments, you need to have characters, you need to have culture, you need to have all the things that, that really make you know, a world live, exist, interact with things. And really, it, it like when we're talking about all these things, it's really about like, why does all this stuff matter? And the reason it matters is because the goal of world building is to really provide a context for the experiences that you're trying to create and a context for, for you to share these things and, and communicate with people without having to explain it. If you build a world right, then you don't have to explain anything that happens in the world because it makes sense. And uh, you know that, that can include videos, images, and interactive experiences. I think the beauty of world building is that you could, you, once you have the world built, you can do so much with it. The only problem is you gotta do all the time, you have to spend all the time and effort to build the world first. But once you do that, things are great. And so, you know, building worlds, right? Like that is such a, such a big sort of undertaking in many ways. 
you got to think about names and characters and streets and, you know, how lights work and all these different things, right? But at the bare basics, like building a world is, uh, can be created using just a simple set of steps. And that's the step that, that's the whole purpose of this workshop is giving you the steps to create and build these worlds. Uh, in order for you to uh, take on this project, create this epic, you know, masterpiece that has all these intertwining parts, you, uh, you could follow a formula and then you could build on that formula. And, and that often takes time, but, uh, but as long as you follow the steps, you'll get to that, you'll, you'll get to that point. And so really it's all about, you know, describing your world with words. And then once you have the words, then you, you build out a mood board with it, with pictures that you just find on the internet or maybe from friends and stuff, maybe from the world itself, taking pictures, uh, you know, across the street, then, uh, then you sketch a design of the world. And that's really just putting it all together, uh, putting the eyes together and visualizing it, uh, using your own creativity. And then, uh, you essentially block out the design for the world. And that's just converting the 2d design the sketch into uh into a world that has depth in it and then after that you populate the world with a whole bunch of different assets and then you bring the world to life with sound and animation and visual effects and that's pretty much it um you know you could you could expand on these steps and we'll look at examples of that but it's really that's really it these are going to be examples that I'll just sort of show you for the next couple of slides. It's just like, this is an example of like what it looks like, right? So describing with words, uh, and this, this could be very subjective. This is, this is me just sort of talking about like what I want to do and what I, what I want to see. And so for me, it was, uh, I had a scene, I had an idea of a world that I wanted to build and it's based off of my comic and all that stuff. So for me, I wanted to have a feeling of solitude with a, with a teddy bear. Uh, in the center of the composition, a uh, similar feeling to how a dog feels when it's on her leaves for school or work. Uh, Teddy is sitting slightly leaning to one side where uh, Roscoe, my main character, left him, and he is waiting for his friend to come back. And uh, this, you know, this can be during the day or during the evening, but uh, maybe have some natural light coming in from that window. And so that's sort of a, that's kind of an idea of like what I thought about when I wanted to have this world. Like that's sort of the idea that I have. Uh, we're not really talking about too many details of like how many walls there are, you know, what, how big the window is, what are all the details of the room? It's really just like the idea. What is in my imagination? How do I like, I just get it from my head to the words. Uh, and it's that simple. And then from there, I, I, sort of have an idea of like the things I want to have in the room. And so I just call it sort of like a messy room. And then I'll just have these items. So it's like a red car bed, you know, worn down walls with stains on the floor, old candy wrappers, dirty clothes on the floor, maybe some socks, underwear, shirts, pants, shorts, uh, shoes on the floor. Uh, and I'm a real big fan of like uh, Jordan 13s. And so I'm just like, anytime there's like shoes on the floor, instantly going to be Jordan 13s. And then obviously like a teddy bear with, um, you know, with an orange and yellow bunny suit in the center is surrounded by, uh, you know, junk, on, junk in the room. And so, uh, and so that is sort of what I had. That was uh, the items I wanted in it. That is sort of the feeling and the idea from my mind. And then I created a mood board. And all this is just pictures on a page. Like I got all this stuff from the internet, I didn't, if I had some pictures, you know, if, of my room or whatever, I probably would have used it, but I didn't. And uh, obviously have Jordan 13s, have like a picture of the bed, uh, have a picture of the teddy bear, and just some examples of what a messy room looks like. And so from there, I, uh, I essentially created a sketch. And this sketch is just sort of an idea of like, what this room might look like. And you know, what I could use for, uh, for my room as a reference. And so, uh, and so it could be as detailed or not as detailed as possible. I ended up doing multiple sketches for it, but it's really just about just like, what does the room look like? And like, how will people feel when it, uh, you know, what, how does, how do the words translate to the visuals? 
uh, and ultimately for the room that people can experience. And so, uh, so then I sort of did a, another iteration of it and, and did this render of it. And so you could check this one out. And so notice how with this, I started off with this blank slate. And after this blank slate, I started to build up all the details afterwards. And so that's pretty much how the design process works, where you're sketching it, then you're designing it. And then at the end of it, you have all these details, but it takes time to do that. Uh, and so often you want to start off with something like this, you know, and this is what we call blocking, where you're going to block out a room or you're going to block out all the different stuff, and then you start to build on it later on. And so let me see if I could get the... So then I end up with, uh, I start to populate the world after I sketch it and block it. And this is what I built in Unity. And essentially, this is a 3D render of the actual room that I have, right? So you have a whole bunch of different things. You know, you have the bed, you have the lights, you have a closet. There's a lot of stuff that you see here that is actually in my mood board. And so if we go back to the mood board, you see like the, you see the uh, like shoes, the bed, you see a lot of mess around on the ground. You even see a, a little basketball hoop and all those details. I, I started to add all those details in it, right? And uh, before you know it, you have a room. And so then after you finish that, after you finish that, oops, let me, after you finish that, you're actually able to create a, an experience. And so this is, a, this is a demo of like the actual experience with the world created in it.
does it have to be so early? And I need to wake up. I just want to go back to sleep. Oh well. Who cares? Here we go. And so as you can see with that, this is, uh, this is sort of a byproduct of all the, pro the planning and all the things that you do with creating a world, right? You, know, you create the world, you create the environment that has all these different features in it. And then once you put the characters in there, they can navigate the world and it all makes sense. We see this in games, we see this in movies, we see this in films, we see this in all these things. But with immersive worlds and with technology, right, uh, it goes beyond just movies and video games. Uh, you can literally create a world and then combine it with your art and through AR, VR, any of these things, you can make it more immersive. And so we're, we're, that's what this is all about is uh, teaching you how to make things more immersive to where you could create stuff like this uh, and, you could, uh, and you could explore these ideas. Uh, with your creativity. Immersive worlds, you know, building worlds that feel real and dynamic, uh, something that you can maybe touch, something that you can move around in, something that you could hear, see, uh, you, you can interact with. And, and so immersive worlds, immersive worlds is uh, really a, an illusory environment that allows uh, you to surround people. And, and so when you're surrounded, you, it feels like you're inside of something, you're inside the world or you're a part of it. And, and this is really all about connecting and commanding the senses. And so whether it's virtual reality, mixed reality, gaming, uh, it's all about uh, engaging the senses, the five senses that we have uh, with the worlds that you're creating. And this, and this makes things more enjoyable and it makes things more engaging. And instantly I think about Grand Theft Auto. Uh, Grand Theft Auto, you know, you have your main characters, but then you have the world, which is a character in and of itself. 
And so many people will play Grand Theft Auto not for the story, but for uh, for the opportunities to navigate the world and 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 what you can do in that world. And so, uh, in order to understand like what immersive worlds are, you have to understand what immersion is. And I honestly think about you know. Uh, plunging into something and having it surround you. And so uh, you're creating something that, that surrounds the audience or covers the audience uh, in the world. And uh, for anyone that has ever gone swimming, uh, specifically in the ocean, right? Because the ocean is sort of its own world in and of itself. Uh, think about jumping into the ocean and being surrounded by water. And so if you think immersion, think being like immersed in water. You look up, you look down, you look to the left, you look to the right, you breathe, you breathe water. That's the world that you're in. And so uh, like anything that incorporates your senses is uh, and surrounds you in a way to where you feel different inside of it than outside of it, that's being immersed. And so how do you make a world more immersive? Really, it's all about incorporating multiple senses into the world. And so we instantly think about like, okay, a, a world that's contained within a book, you have, uh, you have touch because you can touch the book and then you have sight because you can, you, can, uh, you can see the words on the page. And then it's really up to your mind to imagine all the other stuff in the world. So you could say that a book world is less immersive, but if you're finding a way to incorporate sound into it, then you could add sound to the book and that could be more immersive. Uh, for your world and so the same thing with video games right like video games are immersive because you can touch the controller you could see things you could hear things uh, to make it more immersive all you're doing is adding another sense to it so maybe you could smell things too and so you're making the world more immersive by adding multiple senses and so the more senses you have in your world the more immersive it is on the flip side the less senses you have the less immersive it is. And so, uh, and so it, it's, you just sort of think about it that way. It's think about it on a spectrum, not like if it's immersive, but how immersive. Okay, so the activity for this lesson is all about imagining what immersion is. And so you wanna think about experiences that you would like to make that are immersive and what is the experience you want to create? And so write down a sentence or two about the world you want to create that are immersive. They incorporate the senses. What we're, what we're going to do is we're going to be focusing on how to describe our worlds. And so imagining the possibilities of our immersive worlds and really being able to articulate that. And so, uh, and so how do you capture your imagination with words? Uh, really it's all about, you know, you have an idea for some epic experience. Uh, it has nature, mountains, cities, people, animals, monsters, spaceships, ghosts, anything, anything that you could think of. Uh, and it's really about like, where do you start with that, right? And so, you know, often you wanna just start with pen and paper or a word processor or something. And so, you know, you wanna write down what kind of world you want to create and then you know, have a, have a few sentences to go along, uh, go along with it. And so uh, really taking words and sentences can, can really make or break it. And just like the, uh, the one that I created uh, and I showed you, uh, we're really just gonna recreate that and, and start with that step first of just, what do you, like capture your imagination with words. And so why would you wanna use words for building your worlds first, right? Uh, you have all these visuals. Why would you want to use words with it? And it's really to start off with uh, because, you know, building worlds takes a lot of time, but writing down words doesn't. And so uh, you don't have to, if we had unlimited amounts of time, you could create anything and you wouldn't have to worry about time and you wouldn't have to worry about, you know, how long it would take and all that because time isn't a factor, but time is a factor. And so writing down ideas allows for you to explore these ideas but without having to spend hours and days rendering visuals for it. And so uh, 
the reason world, words are great for building word, worlds is because words take less time to write. And, and that's, that's really what it comes down to. It's just more efficient. So in this lesson, the activity is all about describing your world with words. And so write down a few sentences about the world you want to create just with a, a description of it. And it could easily be a description of, I want to create a world with clouds and a building that has dancing people in the sky. Something simple or something complex, but just write down and describe your world. Now that we are able to describe our world with words, now it's time to uh, really find references. And so referencing your world is a really easy way to uh, visualize it without having to do all the heavy lifting of creating the stuff. Uh, so typically the references are for you to uh, really have examples, visual examples for the world you're trying to create. And so with the, we're going to find references for uh, your immersive world essentially. And so why do references matter? That's the big thing. Why would we go through this whole thing of doing research and references uh, when we could just put the pen to the paper and just go from our mind to the, the page, right? Like some people might think that references are just a waste of time. And uh, in many ways, like you could argue, yeah, but like when you're working on a project, references can make or break your project. And so, you know, finding references is just another way to save time when you are trying to imagine something, but it it's also helps if you have a difficult time visualizing something. You could, you could think about it and you could say it and you could write it down, but it's really difficult to like actually visualize it uh, in a way that you could put the pen to the paper and say, this is exactly what I'm thinking about. Uh, it's actually just really, it could just be difficult sometimes. And so uh, sometimes you just can't imagine just details. And so looking at the world and looking at references, it will inspire you to think about details in a, in a different way. And so you might have a big picture of something, but the details really are what make or break an experience. And you just often just don't know where to go with the details sometimes. And so that's why you would look at other people's work or references. And so references because of that will help you create believable worlds. It'll help you create things that make sense to other people. And so they can also just help you develop characteristics and details that like you could just include into your world that you didn't even think about. And so say you're thinking about, you know, making a dinosaur or having a dinosaur world uh, and you want to have a T-Rex. And so you have a T-Rex, it has a big head, mouth, all those different things. Uh, you probably didn't know that it had three toes. And so you seeing a reference, you're like, oh, a T-Rex has three toes. So then you add that extra detail to your T-Rex. And then in the world where the T-Rex is, maybe there's planes and maybe there's these huge trees. Uh, knowing the details of the trees makes it more believable that like this T-Rex existed in that world because of the surroundings, right? If there's a T-Rex and, uh, and it's not a Jurassic Park world, then, uh, then there probably aren't gonna be any buildings. And if there are people, they're sort of Neanderthals. So like having references for what those look like and how those things interact with the world are, are crucial as well to where you don't want to have a person the same size as a T-Rex and uh, you don't want to have a T-Rex that, you know, looks not like a T-Rex. I mean, it, that's pretty much how it works. And so how do you find references? That, that's really the thing, right? Like, how do you find references? Uh, the first thing you could do, go to Google. You could go to Pinterest, you could go to Instagram, you could go to Facebook, Twitter, uh, there's a place called ArtStation, and then there's another place called DeviantArt. And so, uh, so you could, and then like when you're creating a mood board and stuff, you could actually create a, um, yeah, so, uh, so Layla asks like, can a world be simple and realistic or should it be more creative? Uh, it could be anything that you want. So like you could literally just have a world made of gumdrops 
or a world that's just made of clouds. It's a, uh, it's really all about what you want. Once you want to create, you could really have a, a world based off of uh, your house or the, the school that you go into or the world that you live in right now. And so say you just recreated Portland, you could do that. And, you know, just the very nature of you creating it makes it creative. Um, it could be more creative or less creative. I, I, I would say that um, the very nature of you making it or recreating it makes it creative. And so it, it doesn't have to, uh, I would say creativity is like, you know, creativity is uh, based on what you are able to produce, not necessarily what you're able to come up with that's original. Um, and so hopefully, hopefully that explains it. <laughs> But, uh, but with the, uh, when you're creating a mood board, all you have to do is do a Google Doc, essentially. In this lesson, it's all about creating mood boards now. And so make a mood board describing your world you want to make to create with references. And so describing with pictures is really the basis of this. And so use your descriptions that you wrote with and look up pictures and put a whole bunch of pictures into a document. Start with a new, start with a new document, as you can see here. So just make a new document. We're going to title it, so I'll title it Stevens Mood Board. And you can title your, your mood board anything that you want. And then what we'll do is I will create a, uh, go to art station. I'll go to, he go to a place called art station. And this is great for, you know, looking at images of worlds and stuff that people built. So, you know, there's a lot of great world builders out there, artists, people that that make great stuff and I'll just type in I just type in clouds and notice how we have a, a world with clouds in it now and so I could just right click and copy image and then go to my mood board right click and paste that image just like that Yep, so we, we make our own, what we'll do is we'll make our own Google Doc. And then uh, after you make the Google Doc, you just name it, you know, put your name and then you put, you know, mood board. And then you go to Google, you go to ArtStation, right? So we could go to Google. And we could say, I'll type in Cloud World for me, uh, Cloud World. And that cloud world right there, that looks cool. We'll say copy image, go to my mood board and right click and paste that image, just like that.
now we'll, we'll talk about planning. So we'll be talking about planning your world. And uh, all that is, is really creating a roadmap for building your immersive world. Uh, we have an idea of, you know, what we want in it and, and our references and, and what we're trying to create. Now it's, now it's time to, you know, add the details of like, with our, with our world, what do we want to add to the world? What should it contain? What are the details that we want to incorporate into the world? And so really this is a, like, it's all about planning and making a plan for it. And so the reason planning is important is because it's essential for us, like for guiding us through the creative process of world building. If we don't have a plan, then we're just sort of wandering aimlessly and we don't wanna do that. And so in order to do that, we just put the pen to the paper like we did with everything else. And uh, we just create a list of things that we wanna have in it. And, uh, and so if we don't have it on the list, then we probably won't put it into our world. That's pretty much just that simple. And so in order to achieve that, you wanna create, uh, you wanna just sort of capture your the all the stuff in your imagination uh, into like a list. And, and the process of building uh, worlds, you know, can take days or it can take years, but having that list really narrows the focus so that you can flesh out and accomplish all the things you want in building your world. And so, how do you do that? How do you plan it? How do you how do you sort of put the pen to the paper? Uh, really, it's it's all about making a roadmap. And so, this roadmap is just a, a strategy for you know adding goals and adding your desires to your world pro world building project. And it can literally be as simple as just a bullet point list for uh, of all the different features you want to include in your world. Just a bullet point list. That's all you need to do, right? And so uh, this could be as simple as just a, a, a Google Doc or a spreadsheet uh, that allows you to write a list down and then check stuff off as you complete it in your world building process. In this lesson, we're going to be road mapping our details. And so with the spreadsheet or a document, go ahead and make a road map of details and features you want to include in your world. For mine, I had a something with clouds, so I'll add clouds and buildings and mountains and grass and uh, people in the sky. You could add all that. So just try to narrow down all the details that you think you want to add to your world. Doesn't have to be final, but just sort of giving you a, a good starting point. What we're going to do is we're going to go through and make a new document. So we'll go to file new we'll make a new document and this one will be so stevens the title it. and then from there we'll have We'll just set up a bullet point list and we'll say, you know, my world has clouds. So I'll make sure to have clouds. Buildings, mountains, etc. And we'll say, okay, uh, in my world, I want to have, I have clouds. I want to have some mountains, maybe, maybe, a maybe floating mountains. Uh, with trees. Maybe I want to have um, buildings or buildings with, uh, you know, tall buildings. Uh, maybe I want to have a field with uh, grass. Maybe I want to have huge rocks with birds on them. 
So go through and look at your mood board, look at all the things that you want to create with it. And, uh, you know, look at all the ideas that you want to incorporate into your world and then start making a roadmap for your, um, yeah, for your world that, of details that you want to include in it. And use your, use your mood board to help drive, your, drive the ideas that you have. So if you see something in, in your mood board that you want to incorporate into your world, just go through and write it down. And then, you know, if you, there's some ideas that you want to incorporate that aren't in your mood board, go ahead and just write those down too. And, and really create that, that, that checklist that you can, that you can uh, create and, and add stuff to it. And that's really all it's about is just making that checklist of, of details that you will add to your world. And so the design process is really, it's really all about uh, taking the world that we have or the, the ideas from our roadmap and our mood board and, and really starting to visualize it now. And so we're not really talking about composition. We're just really talking about the things that, uh, the way it's going to look, how is our world going to look, right? And so with it, uh, it's really all about just designing. Uh, and so designing is a, it's a planning process and, and it's a, it's a step above just the, um, it's a step above, uh, putting the words to, you know, putting the, the words to our world. It's a, it's about visualizing the world now. And so you want to when you're designing something, you're, you're really thinking about a plan to construct a objects and si systems. And so with this, it like the result of your design is usually called a prototype. And a, a prototype is just sort of a, an outline or a draft, uh, a rough draft for the visual. And so, uh, and so if a roadmap is just detailing the, wor the words of our world, 
the, uh, the design details the images or the visuals of our world. And so the reason we wanna do designs is because we do, when we design things, we wanna to try to create them in a way that it has details that are fleshed out. And so uh, we're, we're essentially making that plan and then we're seeing how that plan interacts, all the details interact with each other. And sometimes you, you know, like words can only go so far, right? And so with my, with my roadmap, what I did is I said, yeah, let me see if I can find my roadmap actually. Uh, with my roadmap, I said there's clouds, cityscapes with loud cars, there's uh, a dancing team floating in the air, there's birds flying around, there's tall buildings, floating mountains with trees. Like those are all details, but like how, like how do all those interact with each other? And, and that's what the design process is, right? So we have these ideas. And so now it's like, how do, how do we connect them so that it makes for a believable world? And, and so like, when we have that list, what does it look for that list to actually exist? And so with it, what we're doing is we're talking about designing things and, and uh, you know, having these designs that can be detailed or, or basic. You know, we could have as much detail or it could be simple, uh, complex, simple. It's, it's really all about what you want, but it's really about exploring the ideas for what they are. And so most people will never see the designs. That's the, that's the interesting thing about it. Most people will never see the designs, but you can create a design so that, um, so that you can remember the details and, and how they interact with each other in your world that you wanna build. And so this is really as a, uh, to help the design process, uh, you know, guide you to the finished goal. You have this idea that's in your head, you, you design it in a way to where you just follow the, the design and then you're able to create that uh, for others to uh, engage with it. And so if you're, if you're working with somebody, having a design uh, allows you to give them the design and, and communicate that idea that you have without actually having to say or explain anything. And so essentially like what you're doing is you're, you're you know, like you're, you're, you're creating something and you are communicating it uh, through art and through creativity. Uh, and, you know, so the creativity speaks for itself uh, through, the, through the visuals. The activity for this lesson is all about designing your world. And so you want to sketch a design of your world that you want to create based off of your roadmap and your mood board. And you can use paper, you could use a computer, you can use Google Drive, Google Drawings, Photoshop, anything and everything. Uh, it's all about just getting that idea and making an original concept of sketch. What I'll do is we'll go to drawing here. So we'll go to new and then drawing. And then in our new drawing, what we're able to do is we're able to have this canvas here. And what this canvas allows us to do is we could have different shapes. So say I want a, I want to have some clouds. So instead of just like having, ooh, I could actually have clouds. So say I want to have clouds here. And so I'll have my clouds. Uh, then say I want to have people dancing on the clouds. So I could use smiley faces for, for that. And we'll say that there's two clouds and those clouds are smiley faces, uh, have smiley faces on them. And this is supposed to be an epic dance battle. And if I look back at my roadmap, my roadmap here, so I have clouds, of cityscapes with loud cars. I'll say, you know, the, the cityscapes will represent, be represented by, by rectangles. And so we know that the city is on the, the city is on the ground. So we'll have different size rectangles for the different buildings in the city. Like that. And then we have, we'll have some birds. So 
I could use, um, actually, I'll, I'll probably want a sun too. So I'll probably want some sort of sun. Then I'll probably want some birds. And the birds can be represented by um, these like interesting little things here. And I can change the color of it, make them black. just have a whole bunch of different whole bunch of different birds floating around and then we'll say that i have a grassy field around the around the city so with the grassy field i think i can use This is sort of the grassy field. Just make it green. And then there's huge rocks and mountains with birds on them in the middle of the grassy field. So then I can have, uh, have this represented by rectangles or triangles. And so I'll say that there's a triangle in the middle of our grassy field. And have another one like that. And then we'll have another one. Just because it uh it's good to have different versions of our of our mountains. And so now we have a we have sort of a design. Taking the words that you have, taking the ideas that you have here, and start visualizing that with the design. You know, I have I have my clouds, I have my people, I have my my birds, I have my sun, I even have the mountains in the middle of the mountains and big rocks. I have my grass, my city. Uh, they're facing off, so it's a dance battle. Um, you know, there's there's a lot of stuff that we could do. Uh, so yeah, so we we'll, we will go ahead and get started with uh, introducing Unity. And so uh, using the Unity game engine is is really good for building worlds. And uh, in many ways, you could build these worlds in Unity, and you could use them in your games. You could use them in your films and your animations. You could even take pictures of them and have that for like two D and three D art. And so it, it's a it's very versatile. And so, uh, so what is Unity? Uh, some of you may be familiar with it because of you know certain games are made in it, but Unity is a, a cross-platform game engine that gives you the ability to create games and experiences in 2D and 3D. And so two dimensions is just sort of X, Y plane, just like illustrations. And then uh, in three dimensions is uh, you know 3D models and space and depth. And it also allows you to uh, import assets and create in, uh, that you create in other software. So like Adobe software, Blender, uh, Cinema 4D, Maya, 3ds Max. And then you can build assets within the editor as well. And then you can actually use code like a programming language called C Sharp and some JavaScript to, uh, to uh, create these experiences. And so it's sort of a, a, a program that allows you to incorporate a lot of different things into it. And those things make it uh, make it easy for you to uh, navigate the world. And so Unity can be used for a variety of different things. Uh, and those things include um, using 2D games, uh, creating 3D games, virtual reality, augmented reality, simulations, and uh, animation. Uh, it can also be used for uh, animating objects and characters and then also designing rooms and environments. And so if you want to do a cityscape, you could do that in Unity. If you want to make mountains and trees with water and, and flowers, you could do that in Unity. Uh, if you wanted to uh, make a, a ball rolling down a, rolling down a hill and, and, and uh, blowing up into 20 million pieces, you could do that in Unity. Uh, and it could also be used for filming uh, t you know, shows animation and doing photography and so if you want to build a cityscape and then take a picture of it 
uh, you could do that in Unity. It's a, there's a lot of stuff you could do with it. And it's really all a matter of like what you want to create uh, and how you want to showcase your world that you built. And so uh, when it comes to like downloading Unity and all that, you just go to unity.com and you can download it. But all of you have the Unity Hub already installed. So we don't have to bore ourselves with this, but it's just, it's always good to get a little familiar with the idea of, you know, how do you get Unity and stuff, right? So uh, one of the things as we're sort of working with our reference computers, uh, and if for whatever reason you don't have a reference computer or you don't have, uh, you don't have your computer available, the thing about Unity is it only works on a Mac or a PC. And so it does not work for Chromebooks. Uh, and so that's just one thing to keep in mind. And so setting up Unity, obviously like this is just to sort of download it. We already have like the Unity Hub downloaded. Uh, but what we'll do is we'll actually go to the Unity Hub and that's where all of our stuff is uh, for Unity. So I tend to have like my Unity Hub uh, right here at the bottom of my screen on my taskbar. But what you could do is you could have Unity Hub of, um, you could search for the Unity Hub by pressing the, the Windows key and then typing in Unity and you'll see how it says Unity Hub right here as an app. So with it, uh, you will you should see that there's a projects, there's a learn, there's a community, and there's an installs tab, right? And then up here, you should see add and new. And so the way this works is that uh, Unity Hub is sort of the hub for everything. And I wonder if I have a slide for it. Um, yeah, yeah. So essentially uh, with the Unity Hub, our projects tab is where we sort of add new projects and create new projects. And if we want to select old projects, we could do that as well. So as you can see, I got tons of projects that I've worked on in Unity. And so this is where you go to like open, open up projects. Uh, the Unity Learn tab is where you're able to learn more about Unity. So if you want to make games, if you want to play games, if you want to do all these different test projects, you could do that. And then there's tutorials that teach you a lot of different things that you could do. So if you want to learn how to make face filters, you could do that uh, in Unity. If you want to learn how to do visual effects, like do explosions and stuff, you could do that in Unity as well. They teach you all that stuff. And it's all for free. If you want to learn how to do programming, uh, you could do that as well. Uh, the community tab is where it allows you to do like forums and blogs. And so any, if you might have any questions or anything you're stuck on, uh, you could always look on the, the forums and blogs to get like some information from the community of users. Uh, and Unity has like millions of users. So uh, it's, a, it's a fun, it's a, it's a good resource to have. And then installs is where all the installs are for your Unity, for your Unity hub. And so uh, the way it works, right, is that um, the way Unity works, and I will actually turn that off. Uh, the way Unity works is that uh, typically with software, we will open up the software and then we'll start a project or we'll open up another project and then we will, uh, we will start working on the project. But that's not how Unity works. Uh, so we have the Unity Hub and then we have the Unity Editor. And so, uh, Typically, we would open up the Unity Editor to create a project and work on it. And in Unity, you want to open up the Unity Hub, you download a version of the editor, and then you go back to the Unity Hub and you start a project using a version of the editor. And so it's a, it's sort of a, a it's not as intuitive as, a, as like other programs are, but like once you, once you sort of get used to the workflow, it's really easy to like pick up on it. And so essentially you, the reason this is, the reason this is like this is because with Unity, they're constantly making different versions of Unity. And you could see that with the different installs that I have. And so the, the versions of Unity are independent of the actual files and the projects in Unity. And the, and the Unity Hub combines the two or connects the two together. And so, you have your projects, you have your Unity versions, and then you essentially interact with the projects through the Unity Hub. And so 
the way it'll work is that you install a Unity version in your installs, then you go to your projects and you create a project, and then you can choose which Unity version you want to open up the project in. And then you and then you start the project. And so it's pretty much like that. And so uh, and so when we're installing your editor, which we'll go through and do, uh, it's really all about um, you know, choosing the latest version of it. So what we're all going to do is we're going to go to the installs tab and then you will most likely not have any as many versions that I have. Uh, and I probably should get rid of half of them now at this point. But, uh, but what we'll do is we'll actually go and start installing a Unity version. And so in order to do that, we'll click the add tab here. And this add tab allows us to uh, create, uh, install, download and install a Unity version. Uh, and this is very similar to what people, what we all saw at the beginning when we opened up the Unity Hub. It was trying to get us to install something. Uh, but here, we'll just actually go through and install it. And so what we'll do is we'll click Add. And then notice how it says Recommended Versions, Official Releases, and then Pre-releases. So the recommended release is the one that we uh, you often want to start with. It's the latest version. It's the one with you know, all the best support. It's sort of the most up-to-date one. Official releases can be either uh, future builds that, uh, that they have out, or they have previous builds that are pretty stable. And the reason you would use one version or, over another is just because some work better for like 2D games, 3D games, AR, VR. Uh, but if you're just trying to get something out of the box and, you know, for world building, you just want to have the latest recommended release. Uh, 2021, if it doesn't have an LTS, long-term support, 2021 is a little buggier, but it, uh, but it allows for you to um, do some new features. Uh, we won't be using any of that stuff. It's, we'll just be using Unity uh, for like the basic features. But uh, if you want to explore, uh, there's a lot of stuff you can explore. You'll see pre-releases, don't do pre-releases. Pre-releases is like, you know, if you wanna get, if you wanna play with features that are coming out in the next two years, uh, you could try that out. Uh, but you probably don't wanna work on any projects with a, with a pre-release because it's just, there's too many bugs with it. And so typically you should have, everyone should see the recommended release of 2020.3.5. Uh, and that's the one that we will all select for this. And so uh, if you see that, sure, go ahead and select it. If you don't see it, let me know. And then after that, we will click Next. Then the next thing that we're going to have is uh, adding you know, our modules to our Unity version. And so we want to have our developer tools selected because this is how uh, this is sort of the back end coding stuff. So if you're ever interested in coding, you can do that. Or you'll have like Android build support and iOS build support. We'll, we'll definitely install those as well because that's for us to do like stuff on our mobile devices. And then we'll have, uh, and that, that's pretty much it. That's pretty much all we need. If you wanna have it in a different language, you could. If you want some extra documentation, you could. But for the most part, we'll have Android build support. We'll have iOS build support. And then you wanna make sure that the Android SDK and MDK tools and open JDK are open as well. Uh, and this is all stuff that like allows for the, the platforms to work correctly. You often won't be actually interacting with the with these two things like and so uh, and so for me I'm gonna deselect because I'm using a different developer tool so I don't want that to mess it up. But um, we'll have uh, we'll click next from there. Should we uh, unselect that one too or no? No, so make sure that you all select it because uh, because me, I use a different developer tool, but you, I don't think you all have uh, other developer tools on, installed on it. So you want to make sure that you have it all selected. Uh, I won't because it'll mess up my whole setup, but, uh, but you should all have it selected. And so then Android SDK and NDK, you want to make sure to uh, agree with that. And then you just click yes for that and it'll start installing. So then you'll have a, uh, you'll have uh, this install working right there. And so, uh, 
as you as you have this working um or as you have it installing let me know if no one has no one sees this installing for them do we all uh see it installing or downloading yep cool 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 and depending on how big your how fast your internet connection is that will determine uh but uh this you know half the battle was done here right uh just getting to this point so yeah it should be downloading and and then it'll start installing and so what we'll do next is we'll go to projects and this is where we create our first well this is where we're going to create our first project and so with our first project what we're going to do is we'll click either new or the drop down menu the difference between new is that when i click new it automatically creates a new project, but notice how it says 2020.3.4. Uh, so new is really for, it. it's sort of your default, it uses your default Unity project uh, or editor version. So if you press the down arrow, uh, you should be able to click 2020.3.5 or select whatever Unity version you will have. Uh, at this point, you'll probably only have one, um, but You'll select it, and then we'll have these different templates that are available. And what these different templates are, you know, we have for 2D games, for 3D games, uh, for HDRP, which is like high definition. So for like very super realistic type of games and movies and videos. And then we'll have universal render pipeline, which is sort of, you could do some cool stuff with it, but, um, but it, it's you know a little more processor heavy. We have these micro games, which are sort of ways to get started with uh, with building uh, with building games and worlds. Uh, if you want to play with like Legos, there's a, a Lego micro game. If you want to do some like mobile and AR stuff, you could do that as well. But right now, we're just going to focus on the three D the three D template. That's the that's the best one to start off with, hands down. And so we'll have that. Uh, done. What I do is I, I have a I have a folder with all my Unity projects, and so you could create a folder for all your Unity projects, and you could place that there. And all this does is it allows for you to to find your projects very easily. And so you could uh, so for me, I have in my my computer, I have a, I have a folder called uh, Unity, and then I created a folder on my computer for Unity projects. And uh, and then I just sort of select that folder, folders called Unity. And then what I'll do is I will name my project. And so we will call this uh, World Building 2. Or World Building underscore 2. Underscore project. And, and the reason I don't have, but when I'm naming my projects, what I what I tend to do is I either if there's spaces, so say if I have a space here, space here, and a space here, so world building two project. If I have spaces, sometimes Unity just acts funny, and it doesn't uh, it doesn't work the way it should when you try to export stuff out, and or you try to save things. And so I try not to have spaces in my project names. And so instead of having spaces in my project names, I'll either change the the first letter of every of every word to a capital letter so that it's easy to decipher or i'll have a have a, di a dash where the space would be or i'll have an underscore where the space will be like that so that it so that the computer recognizes it as just one word and so, uh, and so instead of having spaces, you could, you could do a variety of different things, dashes, underscores, or uh, keep them all together. But, uh, but I'll do that just to be safe, because uh, some, sometimes naming things messes things up. And so after I do that, I'll click Create. And once I click Create, then it'll open up, um, it'll pretty much have this window right here where Unity is starting. So everyone go ahead and create your first project in Unity and, uh, and we'll just wait for it to load. And once it's done, then we'll, we'll start to play around with it and navigate.
our Unity, our first Unity template. And I'll actually go back to here. So there we go. So we have our 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 main scene view, which is sort of our our uh, our sandbox or a viewport, and this is how we sort of like create and build our worlds. This is where we'll build our world in. Then we have our game view, and this game view is where where we have a camera. So this is what the the viewer will see. So anyone that views our world will see it like this. We as creators were able to see it like this, and we're able to navigate it. And then we can control how uh, how the users see it. And so this game view can change depending on like where we place our camera and stuff. The inspector is where we have all our settings for our different objects, and the uh, this projects tab right here is how we make. Uh, all the different assets that we have. So any files, any music, any 3D models, that's where it will be in our project section. And then our hierarchy uh, is where we have all of our objects in our scene. And so the way Unity works is we have, it's called scenes. In each scene, you're able to uh, put together a world. And you can add scenes to other scenes and you could create new scenes and delete them. Uh, but the scenes are how we sort of build our worlds in. So think about the scenes as sort of the sandbox, and then uh, and then the assets are the sand, and uh, and so you add you add the assets to our scene, and then you and you put to them together to make the worlds. And so uh, with it, we'll we'll go over some like simple navigation, because the simple navigation is how we sort of utilize uh, utilize the. Um, the, the viewport and utilize Unity to its full capabilities. So what we'll see here, right, is we have our hierarchy in the top left. And in the top left, we have what is called a, the sample scene. And this is, our, this is the scene that we have open. And then we have these two things. And these two things with this icon, this square icon or cube icon is called a game object. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, all these things are called game objects within our scene. And so when I click on a game object, then you'll notice in the inspector, this has all the settings for a game object. And so at the bare basics, all game objects are the same, but when you, uh, but when you add different components here, so as you see here at the bottom, you could add a component. When you add different components, it changes the way the game objects work. And so, if you see, we have our main camera. And so our game object with our main camera is going to be our, is uh, the game jet object called main camera will have a camera component. And that camera component, if I, uh, if I move this to the side, uh, the camera component allows us to uh, change how the, change how the, um, how the viewport works. And so, uh, what I could do is, if I wanted to add a new add a new camera, I could do that by creating going to the top left to the drop down menu, and this is how we can add different objects to it. And so I could click camera, and now I have two cameras, and you could see how there's a there's a camera object here, and a camera object there, and if we look at both of them, they have the same components in it because they're both cameras. And so I'll go ahead and delete that new camera that we created. And then we'll see that we have a directional light here. And this directional light is pretty much our sun. And the way the sun works is if I wanted to change the way the sun works, notice how when I change it or rotate it, the, the sky changes. And so I can make it dark, I can make it light, I can make it dusk, I can make it dawn. I could do all that because I'm controlling the sun. And so if anything, you can make a world where, you know, the day is, uh, the day only lasts five minutes. And so you could have it to where this thing rotates 
full 360 uh, every five minutes. And, and, and you can play around with that and it's pretty fun. Uh, so when we're navigating it, you'll notice at the top, there is the hand tool, the move tool, the rotate tool, the scale tool, and the rec tool. So the, the hand tool allows you to like pan the, the viewport around. So it doesn't actually do anything with the game view, but it allows you to pan the viewport around. So if you wanted to move it up and down to, uh, to see different details, you could do that. You'll notice how there's this little, this Y, Z, and this like little, you know, square thing here. So if you click this, this allows you to change your different viewport settings or viewpoint views, I mean. And so for some reason, I, I'm not able to select it. Yes, so, uh, so you won't be able to do, you won't be able to select it with the hand tool, but if you move to a different tool, you'll be able to select it and notice how with the click of a button, you're able to change the view of your, the view of your viewport. And so if you wanted to go look above all the whole scene, you could just click the, the Y. If you want to look forward, you could click the Z and then the X like that. And that makes it really easy. And you'll notice how it says to the right, back, left. And that's a, and that helps you like navigate this pretty easily. And so if you, with, uh, with any of the ones selected, you could click alt and you can actually rotate around. So if you hold alt and you, and you click and drag, you can rotate around the, the scene uh, pretty easily. And so we have the, the pan tool, which allows you to drag up and down. If you hold alt, you can rotate around and that's how you navigate the viewport. Uh, you could actually right click to zoom in and zoom out, but these are pretty much the, the only things you really need to worry about with, uh, with navigating uh, the viewport. And so the next stuff is really all about, uh, so the move tool, the rotate tool, and the scale tool, those are really all about um, navigating the game objects. And so uh, notice how we have two game objects here, right? You have the main camera and when you have the directional light. I can select the, the, the main camera by just selecting it. And that allows us to, um, that allows you to modify it or you get selected in the hierarchy and that allows you to, to modify it as well. And so what you can do is you can go through and uh, once you select it, you can move it forward, you can move it back, you can move it up, down, and you can move it in out, just like that. And by doing that, you're able to navigate this in a, a navigate, uh, essentially orient and, and put things in perspective. And so say you want to have more than just a, uh, say you want to have more than just your main camera and your directional light, you actually want to add stuff to it. You can do that by either going to the drop down menu and having uh, going to 3D objects, and we have a cube, we have a sphere, we have capsules, we have cylinders. So say we want a cube in there, right? You could have a cube, and with the move tool, you can move it up and down, left and right, forward and back, just like that. And notice how when I move it back, it gets smaller in our game view. And that's because the game view is based on the camera. So if I move the camera closer, then the game view has uh, shows it closer. If I move it back or I move it any which way, then uh, moving the camera changes the perspective of the game object. And so the move tool works with the, with the game object, like our cube, and so does the rotate tool. You can rotate it using the different axes to modify it, and you could even scale it. You can make it bigger and you can make it smaller. And so the move tool, rotate tool, and the scale tool modify the game objects. The hand tool modifies the viewport. And so that's the difference. 
And so notice how when I move, notice in this area right here, we have the cube selected and then we have the transform. We have mesh renderer, we have box collider, we have all these components. We don't really have to worry about these components here right now. It's really all about the transform. And so with the transform, what we can do is notice how if I move this around, the position changes. And so the position is uh, the position is the coordinates for modifying the move tool. And so the move tool changes the position. And so just like that, the rotation is controlled by the rotation tool. And so if you change the rotation, you change the rotation uh, on the game object with this section. So you could drag and drop, or you could drag the drag it around to change it, or you could use the rotate tool. And the same thing with the scale. You could change the scale. You can make it longer, you can make it shorter, you can make it wider, you can make it uh, skinnier. You can do all that and you can modify it with the with these drags as well. And so that's pretty much how you navigate Unity. And, and that's how you can create cool things with it, just by modifying all the stuff that you have, all the different uh, tools that you have. Blocking your design. Blocking your design is really focused on uh, turning our 2D design into a 3D template. Not a 3D design, but just a 3D template for, uh, for our finished world. Uh, and so this is, this is sort of building on the idea of prototyping, where we're not really focused on the details, but we're focused on just sort of the big picture, the template of the design. And so where are things at, you know, how, like, how are they structured and the scale of them compared to other things? Uh, this is sort of high level stuff, not details, just sort of the layout. And so what is blocking? Blocking is really, or what you call blocking out is really about, um, you know, putting components in an area to show scale and, and really create a plan for how the world can be experienced. And so you wanna say that like, if there's, if there's buildings in the center, then what's around the buildings, you know, we'll have the grass and then maybe mountains around that, maybe other stuff incorporated into it. It's really all about um, really looking at the details and looking at where the things that will have detail in it be at. And so there's no details added. Uh, there's no textures, there's no lighting. None of that is very rough. Uh, this is all about narrowing your focus of the design for the world and, and saying, we'll worry about the details later. Let's just, let's just focus on, let's just focus on laying out everything. And, uh, and this is really just so that like, what the, what the worlds we're trying to create, we don't feel overwhelmed. Because when you add details and you add all these things to your list of tasks, then you can get overwhelmed with, okay, it's going to take forever. I don't know where to start. So what we're doing is we're just saying, let's, let's lower the barrier of entry to get this thing started. And then as we progress with it, we could start adding more stuff to it. And so right now we're just going to be working with very simple stuff. And so how do you block out a design? Really blocking out a design is really focused on starting with the design that you have, right? The one that we did in Google drawings. And then the goal is to convert that sketch, that 2D image into a 3D sketch. And so it's uh, and so sketches in quotations because it's just, you're not actually sketching, you're just, you're just sort of uh, converting the elements in the 2D and adding it into a 3D space. And so it's really just about providing depth to it. Uh, and then, you know, the more details you have in the design, the easier it is to visualize in the 3D space because you like, okay, above the above the buildings is the clouds, and above the, on the clouds is the is the people, and right below, right next to the buildings is the grass and the mountains, and so you know where all those things have an idea of where those things are supposed to go, and so all you're doing with this is you're making sure mm -hmm. that the the different elements go in the places that they need to go in. To, to represent your, your sketch. 
And so, uh, and so what they, you can literally just start by just adding large objects and then, uh, and then we'll be adding smaller objects to the scene. And so primitives are just shapes that are great for blocking out stuff and they allow you to uh, create 3D objects in 3D space without having to worry about the details. And so primitives are just basic shapes. And the best part about it is that like, you could change primitives and change the scale of them and, and fit them in space uh, based on what you want them to, uh, where you want them to be in, uh, and you could add the details later. And so when we're talking about designing and prototyping and, and building our worlds, this makes it very easy and flexible and fluid to, to design things, because if you don't like it in one place, you could just move it to the other place. If you want it to be bigger or smaller, you could do that very easily. In this lesson, it's all about blocking out that design now. And so now we have our sketch. Now it's time to block out our design from our sketch using primitives in Unity. And so using primitives, squares, circles, spheres, cubes, all those things, planes, uh, take the core concepts, the, the template that we have for a 2D sketch, and we're just going to convert it to a 3D template. And so what I'll do is I'll just walk you through like what that process is like. And so with that process, right? So say we have a, say we have our, um, actually, let me see if I could do like a split screen and, and show my design that I have. So I have my design and I have my, I have my viewport. I'll make it, I'll make this as, as big as possible. We have our viewport, we have our hierarchy here, and we have, uh, we have this open space. And so what I could do is I could just start dragging and dropping things and creating stuff in here to just uh, make a 3D version of this, uh, this picture here. And so, First, I could just start with the cube. So what I'll do is I could either right click or I could click this drop down menu. It's easier to just right click and you go to 3D object. We go cube and then we have a cube in our in our world, right? So then I could lift it up a little bit and I can make it I can make it longer like that. And so now as I lift it up, I can, uh, now I have a cube there. And so that represents my first building. And so I could go through and duplicate it. So I can right click, duplicate, and I can move it to the side and I could scale it up, make it even bigger. And now I have another cube, another building. And I could duplicate it again. And I could make this one smaller and I can move it down. And now I have three buildings like that. And if I want, I can make one building further back. I could have another building further up. And so now I have my building shown in 3D space now. So I have my cubes. The next thing I could do is say, oh, I want to have a plane and the plane is where the grass will be. So I could add a plane and that plane can be uh, essentially the ground. And so I could lift it up so that it fits the buildings and then I could make it bigger so that it surrounds the buildings in a, in a large space. And so now, we could say that that's for my grass. And then what if I want to have uh, the clouds? I could right click and I could add an object and we'll say the clouds can be capsules. So see how like the, the cloud, the capsule was sort of round. And so we could rotate it so that it, uh, so that it kind of looks like a, kind of looks like a, a pill or a cloud, something that's round and it's above the city. So then I could 
duplicate it and I could just have them circle or have them surrounding my city like that. You could add more, you could create more, you can make them bigger or smaller. So we'll say that one is small, that one is big. We'll make it, we'll make them, we'll make one go further back. Probably drop it down. We'll make this one bigger or smaller, like that. And so now, the I guess the last thing we could do is we could add some, add some more buildings. So we could say, we'll go with, we'll go with cylinders. And the cylinders can be the can be the rocks, and the mountains. So we'll say, we'll just make this wide and we'll say like, that's a good mountain and we'll rotate it. And that's a mountain there. There's another one. There's another one. And so now we went from a we went from a, a sketch that we had, and now we have a, a world of primitives, just like that. Lovely world of primitives. And so being able to play around with Unity and just with simple shapes, it allows for you to create a whole bunch of cool stuff with it. And so this is where I left off at right here. Uh, we had some assets and stuff like that, but um, if you're just now starting out, what I'll do is I'll start a new project or I'll start a new scene. And so in order to start a new scene, you can right click or you could click this drop down arrow right here. But I like to right click and then I'll go to create and then I'll go to scene. And what I'll do is I'll create a new scene and I will call this world building demo one like that and so when you double click the new scene it uh it creates an empty scene that doesn't have anything in it and so after that what i'll do is i will go through and find where my my design is so with it uh, notice how I have my design right here. And so hopefully you all have your own designs that you have been working on. And, uh, and you should just be able to just have it side by side if you want, or if you um, want to have any other areas of focus with it, you can. So I have my empty, I have my empty project with my main camera, my directional light. And so what I could do with this, right, is with the blank canvas, I look at the different areas, the different things that I have in my scene. And so I have my, uh, I have my, um, my mountains, I have my uh, grass, I have my uh, buildings, clouds, I have these birds over here. And all of these are from my uh, roadmap that I created. And so if I add my roadmap to it, so if I could add my roadmap right here, having multiple screens is always great, but it can be a hassle sometimes. Uh oh. Yep, so I have my I have my roadmap right here, which I used for all the words. 
and so I have the clouds, I have the cityscape with the, you know, uh, loud cars, I have dancing and, and dance battles, which represent, are represented by these. Uh, I have, you know, mountains, I have rocks, I have all that stuff. All that stuff is sort of referenced in here, visualized here. And so with it, all I want to do is start converting this 2D sketch into a 3D space. And so what I'll do is I will start by just adding a, a, a plane or a ground. And so obviously, if you go to uh, if you go to create objects and 3D objects, you have a cube, you have a sphere, capsule, cylinder, a plane, a quad, you know, ragdoll, text, all that. And so with the ground, I probably want to just use a plane. And so a plane is just a just a space, uh, a flat ground plane, essentially. Uh, so this will be essentially my ground. And so then, if I want to have if I want to have uh, the buildings there, I could add buildings, and I could just use the cube for that. And so with the cube, I have my buildings, and I mentioned the rec tool before. And the rec tool is good if you're trying to um, if you're trying to resize buildings and, and, and cubes without having to scale them or figure out how to scale them. And so what you could do is you could have all these cubes here and you could duplicate them, you can move them around like that. And then if you have a uh, if you have a rectangle or if you have the rec tool, then you could go through and you could make it smaller, you can make it skinnier, you could do all the things that you want to uh, to make it fit the mold that you want. And so notice how I have at the ground here already. And so we'll say that that sort of represents the um, the grass, but then I have this uh, at the buildings here. And so with my buildings, I could go through and I could just make a whole bunch of different buildings that uh, that can populate my scene. And it's really easy to just duplicate. Uh, you could use control D to duplicate and you could just go through and just duplicate all these and make a make an interesting looking city. Like that. And so I could scatter it out a little bit more. I could have these be just slightly different just to give it a little bit of variation. Uh, but remember, like these are all, this isn't, we're not focused on the details right now. We're just focused on uh, blocking out everything. So we know our buildings are there. Um, if I want to add another, add another building or add another place, what I can do is I could have maybe a, a cylinder, have the cylinder come out and that could represent my, um, my mountains. And so I'll have the mountains scattered around the sides of them. And so I'll say, got the mountains here. And I could rotate it. And I could duplicate it, rotate it the other way. And have my mountains on this side as well. And then maybe I could add some more mountains over here. I could make it a little larger, like that. And so now I have my buildings. I have my my mountains that are covering the uh, covering the area surrounding it, as you can see here. And then we'll say that like this is our grass, and the grass I could cover it out a little bit more, so that we have grass like that. And so notice how like everything is white and that can often be difficult to, to see sometimes. And so what we can do is 
we can actually change the color of these things. And so what I'll do is I will go ahead and create a new uh, folder. So create a new folder and I'll call this materials. Oops. And with materials, I'll go in that folder and I'll right click and I'll create a new material. And what a material is, is, it a, is it's essentially a, a sort of a wrapper. And the wrapper is, allows you to change the colors, make it metallic, do all the cool stuff. And so what I'll do is I'll actually go through and I'll make a material for the mountains. And then I'll duplicate it. I'll duplicate it and I'll make a material for the grass. And then I'll make a material for the clouds. And I'll make a material for the buildings like that. So all I did was just make uh, make materials. I didn't really change anything, but I've made the materials for it. So we have four different materials, one for our uh, mountains, grass, buildings, and clouds, right? And so I suppose I should make, uh, I should put my clouds in there first. And so I'll do that by creating a capsule, have the capsule here, right? And I will rotate the capsule. And notice how the capsule is in the center. What I'll do is I'll just increase it and, and make it just be a little above. And I'll change my angle of the viewport, as you can see. And so now I have one capsule for the clouds. And so I will just start adding some more. And I could change the, the size of them make them bigger, make them smaller, I can move them around. And it's really all about just seeing what this, seeing how these look in space. And so you can always move these around if you want, but it's all about really realizing this world and saying, okay, this thing has clouds, this thing has buildings. Maybe the clouds are really low. Um, and since we have, we're supposed to have two clouds or, you know, a set of clouds for each uh, dance battle type of thing, what we can do is, uh, is we could have a cluster of clouds. So I'll make one cluster. Yep, how do you make the material folder? Yeah, so all you do is you go to assets, then you go to, you right click in the open space here or you could click this drop down menu with the plus sign and notice how you see folder here. You click folder, then they'll create a new folder right there. And that new folder you can name as uh, materials. I'll name it materials two or materials one. But uh, so that's how you create a new, uh, the materials folder. And then once you, once you do that, you can go in it and then you could right click and you could create and you could go to material and you create that material that's the new material that you'll have and so now that we have our now that we have our clouds right uh the next thing that we can do is we could start making the material colors so if i click on my materials right uh you'll notice in the inspector that there's a uh, albedo and opaque. There's a whole bunch of different settings. Right now, we don't wanna worry about that. We just wanna worry about the color. And so um, I'll say for the buildings, we want the buildings to probably be, we'll say red. We'll just say like, we want red buildings. And so you go to the albedo here, you click the, you click the, the color swaps that we have, and it allows you to change the colors with this wheel here, and then you could change the saturation to where it goes from like white down to black, 
down to the color at the top. And so I'll say that I want it to be red. And then you click X and then it will change the color to a red color. And so now all our buildings are going to be red. So we'll do with the clouds. What we'll do is we'll say that this is going to be like a, a very light blue. I'll say like a very light blue, like a sky blue. We'll have that for the clouds. For the grass, you just click the grass material. You click that, um, that white uh, box right there. And then we'll change this to green. And then last but not least, we have the mountains. And I like the mountains being brown. So then I'll just go, just try to find that brown color. And you kind of have to play around with it a little bit, but finding that brown color. We have that. And so the next thing that we need to do, and this is where things get, uh, this is where things get really easy, right? Uh, so all you have to do to change the color of these materials is you just have to take that material and you just drag it. And so notice how if I drag it over the different objects, it changes it and it gives you a preview of it. So for the mountains, I'll change the mountains like that. The grass, change the grass. The clouds, we'll change the clouds. Just drag and drop, drag and drop. Like that. And then we have our buildings. So our buildings, we go through and just start changing the color of the buildings. And obviously, because we have, we're in 3D space, you got to be able to, to navigate it so that you can see all the buildings in the back. Okay. Oh, looks like I forgot one. So this is our, this is the, the prototype that I have, or this is the, the 3D sketch, the blocking out, right? So we have our mountains, we have our green grass, we have our clouds, we have our buildings right here. And that's pretty much what we did with our with our sketch here. And so now that we have our our design blocked out, it's in 3D space. You can look behind it. You can look in front of it. Uh, the world. I mean, it's it's starting to come together. Let's talk about populating the world. And we talked about this a little bit uh, yesterday, but it's really this is all about adding details to your world. And so the more details you add, the better the world looks and the better the world feels. And so really, how do you populate your world? Populating your world is really all about dragging objects into your scene and ultimately replacing them, re replacing the primitives with the 3D models that have more detail. And so remember that like really the purpose of blocking was just to focus on the design of the world. And then, you know, when you add details, all you're doing is just populating the world with, uh, with those details. So you're just swapping things out. So those red, so the red buildings that I have, I'm just going to swap those out with regular buildings. Um, and, and ultimately like, this is, uh, this is the time to add, you know, buildings, clouds, any other things to your world to really make it come to life. Uh, and so it's not just a whole bunch of, you know, colliders and pills and, and, uh, cubes, it's actually, it's actually, you know, all of the, all the details that we had planned out. And so one of the things about it, right, is do you need to create all of your assets? Do you have to make everything original? And the answer is no. The, the only thing you really need to do is, uh, really have the idea and then, and then tap in with all the resources that are available. You can create stuff, but you don't have to. And so really like building worlds, you have to understand that like it takes a team of creators to build worlds. It might start with the idea, but it really takes a team of, of, of collaborators and creators. And so for a solo creator, like all of us are right now, um, you know, you could really utilize the stuff that, uh, that other people have utilized. And so the, the best part about it is that there are, there are creators and marketplaces that uh, that other creators post assets for for others to use in their in their worlds. 
and uh and these you know the 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 creations that you find on these marketplaces they're called assets and so you hear 2d assets 3d assets they they are um they're pieces of content that uh that increase the level of detail for your uh for the for the worlds that you're building and so really the big thing is like where do you find all these assets right uh it, really the internet like the internet is a great place for it google there's places called Sketchfab, there's Turbo Squid, there's the Unity Asset Store. You'll notice how if you go to Window and you go to Asset Store, you, you go search online. And when you do that, it takes you to this page. And this page allows for you to, uh, to get a whole bunch of cool stuff. And, and so what I could do is I could say, buildings. And I have all these buildings that I can just download here. And more importantly, you can find a whole bunch of free stuff by clicking the pricing and say, oh, I could get a building. I could get, you know, cartoon buildings. I could get sheds and stuff. And what I could do is actually say, okay, I want to get this cartoon building. I will add it to my assets and open it in Unity. And once I do that, it opens this, uh, what is called a package manager. And I can actually just download it. Once I download it, I import it. And after I import it, it's going to be available in my project. So all I'll do is I'll go back to Unity. I have it imported, great. And so now you'll notice how there's a folder called cartoon buildings now right here and what that means is that i could open it go to prefabs and now i could just drag a building there and so without any hassle i just put a building into my scene just like that and i could add another one and another one so now the world starts to look a little more a little better now just by googling stuff and searching for stuff and, and now I could add it to my scene. And I could rotate it. I can make it smaller. I can make it larger. You know, rotate it. I can move it around. And so uh, we, we explored and we got introduced to the Unity Asset Store, which is a, which is a great place. Um, but there's also, there's, there's other places, right? So if I go and I go to Sketchfab and I just look up Sketchfab, Sketchfab is a place that you know you're able to uh, look up different things for, right? So there's there's different three D models that people can uh, look up and play around with. There's um, there's just a lot of stuff that you could that you could download and and, and play around with. Uh, same thing with Turbo Squid, and the same thing with the Unity Asset Store. And so you could go here, browse things, and uh, and download them. And so with it, like once you have your assets, you want to add them to your scene, and you want to add them to to the to essentially your projects that you have. And so uh, you know, in order to do that really all you have to do is uh, drag and drop them. So uh, if you're familiar with like 3D models and uh, the file formats for those, it's typically a, a FBX and an OBJ file, uh, very much like, you know, Microsoft Word uses .DLCs. Uh, it's just a format for, uh, for these different uh, assets. And uh, and I'll, I'll walk you through how to like actually import these assets in and what the process would be for it. But, um, but then, you know, obviously you have the Unity Asset Store, which we went over with yesterday, but then there's, a, then there's assets that like you could just download as packages. And once you have these, then you can go through and you could start adding those to your scene or to your project. And in order to do that, all you have to do is go to assets right here at the top, right next to edit and game objects. You go to assets and you go to import custom package. 
And then once you have import custom package, you go to where the where you downloaded the file folder and we'll say, let's do the adventure pack. So what we'll do is we'll open it and then it'll just start trying to add all the stuff to it. And you'll notice how there's already some stuff here that I already have. So I'll just click import just cause. And once it does it, it, it imported all the stuff. And now I have this, uh, now I have this thing called Polygon Adventure, Polygon Adventure. And what Polygon Adventure does is it has, um, it has all these different assets that you could use right here. And so notice all of these things, right? Like these are all mountains and trees and all these different buildings uh, and stuff that you could use for, and, you know, even have clouds. And all these things are stuff you could use for, um, for building out your world. And so what we can do is we could do that with the city pack as well. So we go to import package from the assets, go to custom package, and we have our city pack. We click the city pack, we open that, Once it finishes with the content, I already imported all the stuff in there already. Uh, and so we could go back to our assets and there's Polygon City. And then when we go to scenes, we go to demo. And this is a, this is a scene, this is a demo scene that they have where it shows you all the, all the world stuff that they built. And so I should be able to find doesn't look like they have a scene for it. Yeah, it doesn't look like they have a scene for for all the the assets that they have, that they have laid out. Unfortunately, hmm, I thought they did. Oh well. Uh, so so what that allows you to do is it allows you to um really look at all the different assets that are available in this. And so if I wanted to look at some prefabs or some models of like different buildings, you could do that by going into like Polygon City, then prefabs and buildings. And once you do that, you can look in the inspector and notice how we have this building here. What I could do is I could make this a little larger. And so it has these buildings here. And just different parts of these buildings allow you to, to create cool things. Office buildings, different variations of them. And you just have a just have a lot of stuff. A lot of stuff to play around with. And and uh, create stuff with. And also, if you have, uh, if you downloaded the, the 3D models asset pack, then there are some other models that you could use. This one is uh, Black is Beautiful, and then there's one called Afro Pastel. And so what you could do in order to add those into it, is you go to your assets and you create a new folder called models. So just right click, create folder, and you could call it models. When you go into the folder, what you can do is you could take, go into the asset pack that we, that you downloaded and where it says source and it says FBX, you could just drag and drop that into the empty space on the folder. And when you do that, it allows you to, uh, automatically import stuff in. So now when I click on that, this is the model that we have right there. And I could do the same thing with the other one, pastel Afro. I'll 
go ahead, add that to it as well. And there we go, we have another one. So these are these are two uh, these are two models that you could add to your scene as well, to uh, to do some cool stuff. And so, just to give you a glimpse of like what these what these look like in the real world or in your scene, I'll go to my models folder. I can find it in all the many folders that I have. And I will add these two to my scene right here. So I have, I have this one. And then what I can do is I could just make it smaller. I get places on top of the building that I have. And I have this one. I can place it on top of this building or place it in front. So now, all I did was just download some download some assets and I just placed them in the world that I had. Just like that. And so with it, all you're doing is just uh, finding assets and, and starting to download those and, and play around with them. And so it's uh, so it's a pretty pretty simple process. It allows for you to to make some cool stuff and, and not have to worry about the hassles. It's time to talk about kit bashing. Because kit bashing is is really um, how you're going to be able to make use of all these different assets that you uh, that you are able to download and find on the internet. And so this is all about mixing and matching uh, assets to populate your world. And so when you're trying to populate stuff, you add stuff to it, and then you kit bash it to sort of make it all make sense within the world. And so kit bashing, if you remember from world building one, it's really utilizing elements from other things and using it to create something unique and different. And it really saves you a lot of time and allows you to focus on the idea that you wanted to explore and not the little details that can be meticulous. And so that allows for you to you know, avoid the technical aspects of creating things and allows you to focus on the overall idea that you're trying to create. And you could spend more time on the emotions and the themes of the world and not on drawing rocks or mountains. And so it, uh, it really makes things, uh, really allows for you to optimize your time a lot better when you're working on these things. And so the kit bash, all you're doing is you're just taking something from one place and you're moving it to something different. And then you're being able to uh, copy and paste and, and move it around so that it so that it works. And with all the assets that you have, like in your projects, you can mix and match them to so that they really fit in in a way that feels natural. In this activity, now that we have our three D template done, it's time to start kit bashing. We can populate our world with a whole bunch of different assets, and Really just, we're just adding a variety of assets to our world and combining them to make something new, populate it, give our world uh, an identity, a look. And so go ahead, take that on. Uh, the, one thing about the, the one thing about the projects folder that is really good is that um, if you go to assets, notice how we have our top level view of our different assets, but if they're named correctly, you could actually, instead of having to open up all these folders, all you have to do is just go through and type the name of the asset in there. So if I want a car, there's all these different cars that I have. You know, I have a cart, I have a cardboard, I have cart props, I have car wheels. I have, you know, different cars here. If I want a mountain, I could just type in mountain and I have access to a mountain that I want. I have multiple mountains. And these are, these are really easy to use because uh, you just drag and drop them. And so uh, once you have all the assets imported, then it's, all about, then it's all about picking which assets you want, even if I want a building. Want a building? I got tons of buildings that I could choose from. 
you know? I got folders of buildings. I've got apartment buildings. I got a whole bunch of different things that I could choose from because, uh, because I have the, in, the assets in my project. And so with that, I could go through and if I want to drag and drop some in there, I could do that. See, I could drag an apartment building just like that. And so go ahead and uh, play around with all the different things that you have available. Uh, that is our time for uh, just playing around with cat bashing and stuff. Um, so hopefully you were able to play around with stuff and if I can find it. We started off with our design that we had. And from that design, we were able to create a, a, a block of, uh, for our design with some colors. And so now, once we finished that, now we actually were able to essentially create this world. You know, so this is a uh, this is the one that I was working on, uh, and as you could tell, we have our clouds, we have our. Um, let me see if I could have the side by side. We have our clouds, we have our mountains, we have our buildings, we have our grass, we have all that stuff right here, and we were able to just you know put buildings together and do all that stuff uh, with the assets that we had. So we just focused on kit bashing. Now that we have an idea of like how to kit bash and, and sort of populate our world, uh, it's time to bring our world to life by adding some motion to it. And so in order to add some motion, it's really, it's really pretty simple. It's, uh, it's, you know, using just basic animation that, uh, that we can, we can create with our, with our, our timelines. And so how do you bring the world to life? Uh, you could bring the world to life by just like really giving it motion and sound. And so it's just like, think about all the things that like constitutes essentially living. Um, and that's often, you know, how it moves, uh, 
the noises it makes, the sort of the characteristics that come with those different objects. And so, uh, you know, what you could do with it is, uh, is incorporate these different things into it so that it makes things more immersive. And so you want to create a world that moves and, and has sound and, and looks a particular way. And uh, by doing that, it resonates with people on a, on a, a deeper level. And so when it comes to motion and animation, there's a, there's a couple of different types. Uh, we could talk about, um, you know, keyframe animation, which is sort of frame by frame animation. That that's what we'll sort of go with. And it's focused on just moving objects in space and, and having each uh, location be a keyframe. And so when you go from one keyframe to the next, there's the motion. And then, uh, and then there's skeletal animation or character animation, which is something that we'll go over in detail in one of the, uh, the optional sessions that, that we'll have. And all that's really focused on is like, you know, animating with characters, animating with, uh, with different skeleton rigs and stuff. So dance animation, hand, in, hand animation, motion capture, uh, that stuff is a, uh, you know, skeletal animation. And so what skeletal animation looks like, right, is essentially this, right? So like you have objects, you have, you have um, them moving in space and they're moving in sequence with other, with other components of that object. And so when you open up this, uh, this character, there's bones and there's all these different extra parts that allow it to move in a way that feels natural. And so at the end of it, you have a character that can dance and, uh, and it's all using the same tools that you're creating for other things. And so what we're gonna do is we're going to start adding our animation timeline and adding the animation tools for us to make some motion. And so when we go into our, when we go into our, uh, our hierarchy, your hierarchies might not look as great um, but uh, a great way to incorporate things in is uh, to essentially uh, create a new empty object, and then that new empty object can, can house a lot of different things. It could be a container. And so before we get started with animation, what we'll do is we'll create an empty object. And we'll just create an empty object by clicking this drop down menu, and then go to create empty. And then that'll create an empty game object. And what we can call that is animation timeline, like that. Just call it animation timeline. And once you do that, what you can do is uh, now we can start adding our animation timeline to it. And so in order to do that, you can go to window, go to sequencing, and where it says timeline right here. When you click that, it has this timeline that we that we like, and we could actually just drag the timeline down so that it it fits right at the bottom. And so now we have a timeline in our scene. So if you select it, you see how you can rotate the timeline. There isn't actually uh, there's no nothing that renders, so you won't actually see the timeline in the in the in the scene, but it's there. Uh, and so what you could do is when we have our timeline here, notice how when there's nothing selected, it says to create a timeline, select a game object. When, it, when we select the animation timeline game object, then it says to begin a new timeline with animation timeline, create a director component and a timeline asset. Uh, and so in order to make this uh, add a timeline to the scene, what we're gonna to need to do is we need to add the component. And the beauty of Unity is that all you have to do is click a button and it does a lot of that stuff for you. And so what I'll do is I will have this icon right here. Actually, it won't let me click it until I actually create a timeline. So that's what I'll do. So we'll just go ahead and create. And then we will create again or just click save. And now we have an animation timeline here. And not only that, but we have a playable director that appears in our animation timeline. 
And so what I can do is whenever I click a new object, notice how the timeline goes away. But if I click the animation timeline, the, the timeline comes back. In order to keep the animation timeline there, regardless of if I click the main camera or any of the other game objects, I can click this lock, this lock button right here. And when you do that, it stops it from going away when you click other objects. And this is really good to do because it allows you to, to work without having to mess stuff up. And so when you go into, you can go into the options or the settings, this gear icon in the top right, and you could go to where it says frame rate. And frame rate is essentially how many frames or how many pictures, how, how much information is gonna be in your uh, animation. And so what I like to do is I actually like to just drop it down to 24. That makes, that makes the file size a little smaller and it allows for us to do a lot of cool stuff um, without having to do, uh, you know, without having to tax our computer with it having to uh, make a whole lot of frames. And so the frame rate, all that means is that for um, within a minute, within a second, uh, within a second, it's either going to have 24, 24 friction, pictures, 30 pictures, or 60 pictures. And each picture is, uh, you know, it's essentially equivalent to data. And so the, you know, at 60 frames, you'll have 60 pictures. That means that you'll have a lot of, a lot more uh, data per second than, uh, than if you have 24 just because 60 is larger than 24. And so just by just uh, by having it at 60, it means that your file sizes are gonna be much bigger. And so in order to make things a little more optimized and easier to render and easier to use, uh, try to have things at 24. And so now that we have that, uh, the one thing that we want to do is we wanna say like, okay, what is what are the things that we want to animate and so we could create a new folder and we could say uh and we could call that just animation we'll call it animated objects right there and so we call this animated objects. And so in order for us to, in order for us to animate something, we actually need to have some objects to animate. And so in our animated objects folder, we could right click on the folder and we could add a 3D object and we'll just add a cube. And what we'll do with the cube is we'll actually bring it forward like that. And we'll just place it on this, we'll place it on this building here. And then what we could do is we could actually just change the, change the color of it. So we'll make the, we'll make the, we'll make this cube actually purple. So let's see if I could actually change the, see if I can actually change it. Any problems right now? Mm -mm. Hmm. I wonder why it is acting weird. Oh well, I'll try it this way. There we go. So we have our we have our purple cube. And the purple cube is on our, uh, it's on our building. So let's say that we want to take the purple cube and we want to animate it to where it jumps from one building to the next, then to the next, and then back to the, back to that final spot. So what we could do is we have our cube here and we'll just name it jumping cube. In that jumping cube, in order to make it an animated object, we could take the jumping cube and we could just drag it down 
to their timeline like this. And when we do that, you see how it says activation track, animation track, audio, and signal track. Activation track is when you're just able to turn things on and off so they go invisible and visible. Activation track or animation track is when you're able to animate stuff, make it move. An audio track, which is what we'll do in the next section, that will be allowing us to make sounds. And so what we'll do is we'll just do an animation track and notice how we have our animation track here. And so using our move tool and our, and our transform tools, that's how we're able to animate. So notice we're just sitting on this, we're sitting on this right here. In order to start our animation, you could click this red button and this will start the animation. And so after you click the red button, anything you do to move this object is where is how it's going to uh, animate. So what we'll do is you'll click the red button, it's blinking and it's saying re start recording. And so what we'll do is when we make just a slight movement, notice how there's a, there's a little diamond here. That diamond is called a keyframe. And the diamond allows us to make, uh, you know, make the positions of everything that we want for our, uh, for our animation. So that will be the starting point. And so we'll say that this animation is gonna be five seconds. And so because it's five seconds, what I could do is I could just go to five and I could just add another keyframe. And that keyframe will, uh, will represent the, the final point. So we have one keyframe, which is the start, and the second keyframe, which is the end. And that end is gonna be the same exact spot that it, that it started in. And so what we'll say is that uh, at one second, it goes to this building. So we'll just move it over and it creates that keyframe. At two seconds, it'll go to this building as we could see here, I could just get it going. And then at three and a half seconds, we'll say that it goes to this building. And then at five seconds, it goes back there. And just to make it a little, little more impactful, we'll have it in between each one of these, it'll sort of go up and down. Like that. So now if I click stop recording, I can go through and I can, we could watch the animation that plays. So now, when I click play, we should see our animation. Just like that. Of just a bouncing cube. And so with that, we'll go ahead and we play with all our animation stuff, we modify the keyframes. Really the, the thing that we wanna do is, uh, you know, create our, create a new game object, name it a timeline, however you wanna name it, animation timeline, world timeline, create an animation timeline by pressing the, the, the create button. And then we'll set the frames to 24 in the options, and then we'll animate an object with keyframes. Now that we have our world sort of populated, now it's time to give it life. And so we're gonna start adding some animation to it. So we're gonna create a new game object. We're gonna name it world timeline or whatever name you wanna give for the timeline. We're gonna create an animation timeline, set the frame rate to 24 frames per second, and then we're going to animate objects using keyframe animation.
Okay, so hopefully you had a good chance to uh, play around with some of the animation stuff. And it's really just all about just, you know, recording keyframes, playing around with them, uh, manipulating them, manipulating objects, and then uh, having fun with it. And you know, once you're introduced to it, like this is this is animation right here. So if you're interested in making cartoons or anything like that, like this is it, this is how you do it. And so now it's time to uh, bring sound into, into your world. Uh, and so why does sound matter, right? Like sound engages the audience in a, in a very immersive way. And remember like the concept of immersion, right? Like where we are jumping into the ocean and it's just around us, like water's everywhere. We're immersed in water. Uh, think about that. Think about instead of it being water, but instead of it, uh, it instead of it being water, it's it's sound. You know, and, and sound is all around us. It, it just sort of encompasses us in many ways. And so, when you when you add sound, you're able to incorporate hearing into an experience that makes the world more immersive. And so, a uh, sound evokes a lot of emotion, mood, and it emphasizes a lot of the things that people see in your world. And so, if you uh, want to really make things immersive, you already capture the eyes with your visuals, but now you add sound to it, and now people can't escape it. It really affects the way people can experience it. And, and more importantly, sound and visuals can evoke something that, that neither one can do alone. And so sound is very good. And so how do you use sound? How can you use sound to enhance? Uh, right. So like you can use sound to to add more information to the world. Right. And in uh, every object you could think of ha that moves has the capability or, or potential to produce sound. And so just think about like, what do those sounds look like? Right. And so uh, more importantly, like you have all the control over these little details with it. We we focused on blocking. We focused on all these different things. And so now this is where we could start adding details to our world. We added some details in the visuals. We could add details with sounds. And so you can, you can add, uh, you know, say you have a dog and a dog, you, you want to make quack like a duck. You can do that. Uh, if you want to have a nature environment that sounds like Mozart, you can do that as well. If you want to have dance battles, blasting Megan the Stallion to some clouds, you can do that as well. Like there's so many things you can do with, uh, with sound. And so there's a lot of places where you could get sound and this, uh, and these are going to be things that like we'll add to the PDX open tech thing for you guys to play around with later on. Uh, but there, there's just tons of places where you could get sound. You could even record your own sounds. You have your phone, you could go outside, you could record your voice, you could record yourself playing music. Uh, if you have friends that play music, that works great. Uh, if you know how to get stuff off the internet, sound files, even the stuff that you make in, in the other workshops, those sound files can be incorporated into your world and to make it more immersive. There's other ones that we have here um, that I'll post in the I'll post in the chat, actually. Yeah, I'll actually post in the chat. And these are uh, these are places where you can get uh, different sounds from. And uh, a lot of them are free. There's a lot of sound effects, explosions, barking, all types of stuff. And and so with it, what we're going to do is we're actually going to play around with some uh, play around with adding sounds to it. And so what we're going to do is actually go through. And we're going to go to our assets folder which we have, and we could create a new folder. And that new folder is going to be called, where is my assets folder? Create folder, there we go. And we'll call that audio, we'll call it audio. And so we have a folder called audio right here. And obviously there's nothing in it right now. But if we go back to our, uh, the audio sounds that we had, our sounds from our 3D, uh, our world building sounds folder, if you open it, there's gonna be a whole bunch of different sounds that you get add to it. We have city traffic, we have bird ambience, we have uh, instrumentals, we have 
uh, crowds. We have forest ambiance, jungle sounds. Uh, we have a, there's a lot of sounds that highway traffic. There's a lot of sounds that we could add to it. And so what I'll do is I'll just copy and paste all these, or I'll just drag these, all of these into my into my folder. So they're all just going to go into my projects folder. And it may take a little while, uh, just because it, it's it just takes it might just take a while, a little while to just import them all in. But it's as simple as just you have a sound file. You could just drag it into your audio folder, just like that. Very simple. And, it, uh, and Unity does all the heavy lifting for you. And I suppose I could have only did like a couple of sounds, but Hey, what do you know? So now notice how we have all our sound files in here. And in Unity, you could actually play around with these. So you could hear the music, you could hear the sounds. Forest ambiance, birds chirping, we have the jungle, we have all of that. And so it's like, okay, now that we have them in our project, how do we actually get them into our, uh, into our, our world that we built? We have the animations, right? And so now we need to add our, we need to add our sounds. So what we'll do is we'll go back to our hierarchy. We'll click that plus sign drop down, and we'll create a new empty. And this one we're going to call audio manager. And when we go to audio manager like that, we'll just name it audio manager. And so now that we have our audio manager, the next thing that we need to do is we need to go to add component in our inspector for our audio manager, and we'll type in audio. And when you type in audio, there's all these different things that you could use for audio. But what we want is called an audio source. And that audio source allows us to put audio clips into our world from here. And so now that we have our audio manager, we can drag the audio manager into our, um, we, could, we could drag our audio manager into our timeline like this, just drag it down into the timeline and where you see that like white line that pops up and you could call this an audio track. And the audio track is where we are able to create, uh, add the different audio effects to it. So if we want birds chirping, we could add that just like that, just drag and drop. And so once we have that done, I'll go through, I'll place that. And then when we click play, we have a sound playing. And if you can't hear that one, what I could do is I could put another one in there. And we could have this one play as well. So now, as this, as this plays, it plays that audio sound too. And so 
the interesting thing about this is that we could actually layer on our sounds. So say you want some to play on the timeline with their animation, and then you want others to play in the background, you could actually do that. So what we'll do is we'll say, we'll duplicate the audio manager. And we could say that this one can be just background. This one can be music. And so this audio manager that just plays music will say, hey, we want to play a, a, an instrumental. So we want to have that one play. And so what I'll do is I'll click I'll just add the audio clip to the audio source. And afterwards, I can just sit here, make sure that, you know, everything is good. Uh, save it. And this is the first time we could actually press play, this play button here, and we could see what happens. Actually, we want to make sure that our, our camera is faced in, put in the right direction. So we'll just say, I'll move my camera and rotate it. Or what I could do actually, which is really easy, is you can press, click on your camera, main camera, because if you go in your game view, it's probably going to be a, a horrible looking view. If you go to the part of your viewport that you're at, that you really like, so say I want to frame this in a good in a good space like that. I click the camera. I go to game object up here. And I go to say align with view. And when I do that, it changes the view just like that. And then I'll hide all the stuff I don't want to see. And then at the end of it, I'll click play. Just like that. And so with it, go ahead, play around with the sounds. Uh, I'll give you like a couple of minutes to, to play around with sounds and stuff. But it's all about creating a new game object, naming it audio manager, adding an audio source component to your audio manager, and then adding the, the MP3s or the, the WAV files into your project and then just adding it to the world like like we like you just saw me do and so you just have two a component here have that called audio source for audio manager and then you just add one of the sounds into it now that we have things moving it's time to give it some sound right because everything that moves has sound and so now we're going to create a new game object. We're going to name it audio manager. We're going to add an audio source component to our audio manager. And then we're going to add an MP3 or a WAV file to our project and add those sound files to our world. It's time to really give us an opportunity to hear what we're seeing in our world. Final thing that we're going to be doing is uh, learning how to capture and and save files. And so what we're gonna be doing is we're just looking at recording the world. And, and the reason we wanna do that is because we wanna be able to capture and share. And so we have stuff in our Unity timeline and in our editor, but how do you actually share that with people? And so the reasons we wanna like record the world is because uh, you know, that's how we are able to let other people see it and experience it. Uh, if it's not a game or anything, then like you want to be able to like send a video out. And so many of the things that we know and we experience uh, are often just shared be and recorded and shared on the internet. And so for the worlds that you build, you want to know how to how to share with others as well. And so uh, from there, what we're going to do is we're going to um, 
use the Unity timeline, and we're going to use some recording tools to do that. And so the whole point of sharing, right, is to just think about the things that we like, honestly, just think about the things that we see around us all, all the time, you know, whether it's Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, TikTok, all those different things. Uh, the reason those things are out there and the reason we know about them and we enjoy them are because people share that stuff with us. And so sharing contributes to a lot of the things that we enjoy and that we know and that we love. And so when you share, people see it, and then that leads to more opportunities to create great work or even build a community around your work. And so when you have a following, it's because you share your work and people re it resonates with people and, uh, and they want to show their appreciation. And so if you make some cool stuff, share it. And then when you share it, you'll reap the benefits of sharing it. And so the whole point of this is to teach you how to share. And so what we're gonna be doing is we're gonna be learning about the cinema machine and the Unity Recorder. And those are two things that allow uh, us to share, record and share the stuff from our timeline. And so when you go to, when you have cinema machine, uh, you know, it allows you to put all these different cameras around and then you can animate them and create, uh, you know, a whole bunch of different timelines and controls. And then the Unity Recorder allows you to save these these recordings as videos that you could post on YouTube and, and all those different things. And so in order to do that, what we're going to do is we're going to go to window and we're going to go to package manager. And in package manager, we're going to go to where it says Unity Registry. And then we can type in cinema. And when you type in cinema, then cinema machine will appear. And you can install that one. So you just go through and once you have cinema machine selected, you click install and it will go through and it will install all the stuff that it needs. And then once it's finished, uh, if it's done installing, it'll say remove. And so you don't want to say remove. Uh, if you want to download some of the examples that they have, uh, you could do that. Otherwise, the next one we want to do is you'll type in record. And that will show up the Unity Recorder. And you click install for that one. And again, if you, there's some sample scenes that you could use, uh, but you could tell if something is recorded or that something is downloaded and installed because there's gonna be a green check mark and it will say remove here. And so now that you have that, then the next thing that you do is you'll see that there's something called cinema machine up here. And then if you go to window and then you go to, I wanna say general, and you go to recorder, there's something called the recorder window. So those are the two things that we just downloaded. Uh, Cinema Machine, which is up here, and then window, general, and recorder window is right here. So if you click the recorder window, it, it's, a, it's a window that you could have placed, um, you could sort of parent it anywhere or place it anywhere. And then Cinema Machine, what we'll do with that is we'll click Cinema Machine and, and we'll say Create Virtual Camera. And what Create Virtual Camera allows you to do is it allows you to create a camera that you can animate. And when you do that, you actually create a, a, a virtual camera here. And so in order to make our animation and stuff work with our, with our camera, what I'll do is I'll place our, I'll place the, the game view on the side so we could see it. But all we're gonna do is, um, all we're gonna do is actually create a whole bunch of different cameras and then we're going to blend them together so that it shows a little bit of motion. 
And so we're only doing this for five seconds, right? And so what we could do is in our timeline, because we should have the timeline still locked, in our timeline, we click the drop down menu. And what it allows us to do is we can have a cinema machine track. And that cinema machine track allows us to uh, put cameras there. And so we'll just have a cinema machine track, just like that. And then what we can also do is we can add a recorder track. And the recorder track says, when you press the button, it'll record all the stuff on that track. And so we'll add that recorder track, just like that. And then when you, uh, before we go on and to, to populate our track uh, for the cinema machine, we can right click, we could select the recorder track, we could right click it, and then we can add recorder clip. And what that will do is it'll create a clip that will be five seconds. So whenever we click record, it'll automatically record it. And so it does all that stuff by itself for us. And so when you see this thing that says none cinema machine brain, you can click this dot here and you'll select main camera because that's the main camera that we'll use for our cinema machine. And then all we do is we, we move the cameras around and we orient them in a, in a space. And so we'll say that like our first camera can start here. And what we could do is we could just drag and drop that camera down into our, into our scene like that. And then we could create a new cinema machine camera. So create virtual camera again, and it'll create CMV cam two. And so when we create a new virtual camera, we go to another space on the timeline. And with that other space on the timeline, we can move our camera, our CMV cam two, we can move it to another space. We can rotate it. We can modify it. And then we could just add that to our team, our, our stuff again, like that. And then what we'll do is we'll do just another camera. So we'll just do three cameras. Actually, no, we'll just do two. And so what I'll do is we'll say that like one camera goes, uh, one camera starts off, and then it'll move to the second camera. Oh yeah, the, the random decimals. Yes, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a hassle sometimes trying to play with those decimal points. Uh, but you know, it, it's, once, you, once you start to play around with it, it, it becomes so much easier. And so what I like to do is I try to stay with whole numbers. And so what you could do is you could actually just in the, in the rotation transform, you could just rotate it. Uh, you could click 90, you could click um, you know, 180. It's all about what you wanna do. And so now that, we have our, now that we have our two cameras, right? So say we can sort of drag them, drag the side of it. So there's these arrows. So if you see the arrows here, you could drag them to make them larger or smaller, but you could actually make those arrows overlap, uh, those clips overlap. And so you could have it overlap like that. And so the overlapping is where the animation comes from. And so what we could do is, uh, and I could, I'll hide this so that it doesn't show it, but, when when you oh when they overlap you'll see that like the camera actually moves it looks like the camera's moving just because of that overlapping and so what happens when it when we play it right what happens when we play is that we will get that cinematic look of rotation and animation when we play our timeline and so when we play the timeline We 
just we just animated the camera. And so not only did we can we animate the camera, but when we animate the camera, we'll be able to record it now. And so notice how we have in the recorder, we have we can add a recorder. And we could call that a movie clip. And all a movie clip is is just uh, a movie is is just a way for us to uh, record our record our clips. And so notice how remember the frames per second was twenty four, so we could change that to twenty four. And then what we could have is we could have the recording mode on manual. And so we'll say start recording. We could do that. We have it on game view, which is the source that we want. Include the audio. We'll drop this down to the quality to medium, just because we don't need high quality. And then we have the file name and stuff. And so the thing about the output that we want to make sure is that we want to make sure that it, it's a it's an output that we uh, that we have in our scene or that we have in our project. And so it typically is the, the, the project folder that we have, the assets folder. And with that assets folder, or we'll just click in the project, we'll say path is project. And then, uh, and then it'll save in, in, a, in a file location that we can actually access. And so with it, all we can do is just click play here or start recording and then it'll actually record our, our file. And so we'll just try that. And then after we stop recording, we can open up the file location. That is our recording right there. Just like that. And for this activity, now that we have our world moving and it has sounds, now it's time to record and share our stuff. And the best way to do that is by using the recording features. And so we're going to set up a virtual camera, add them to our timeline, and record a 10 second video of our world. And after that, we'll be able to post it and share it with our community and our friends. And so now that we're done with everything, right? We created a world, we got to explore world building. And so as a recap of the course, we were able to see what world building is, what are the elements of world building that we need, introducing the Unity game engine, exploring steps to create our world. And not only that, but we learned some animation in Unity and how to crawl the internet and kit bash some assets. From this long journey, we were able to create a lot of stuff too. And so we created a description of our world. We created a mood board. We roadmapped all the stuff we were going to build for our world. We sketched stuff for our world. We created a 3D template, added assets, animated, added sounds, and then we also learned how to sh record the world and share it. It was a lot of stuff that we did. And more importantly, we were able to really explore the tools that allows us to create from our imagination, put it on paper, and then put it out into the world. It was a lovely journey and I really appreciate everything that you are all able to accomplish with this. Be sure to share this in any way possible. And I really encourage you to continue making wonderful worlds and exploring the tools. Whether it's Unity, whether it's Unreal or another tool, whether it's Blender, whether it's just 2D animation with pen and paper. Uh, world building is a wonderful experience that allows for you to build community and share your ideas without having to explicitly state it. 
It's all about experiences. And for me as a creator, I really appreciate having the opportunity to create experiences that are impactful for others. And so again, hope you learned a lot of stuff from this world building series and just journeying into world building, creating and hopefully we could create more immersive stories and just make the world a, a more creative place. <laughs>